won the 24 hours of Daytona and the 24 hours of Le Mans in the same year. You'd have to go back to 77. Hurley Hayward was the first man to do it. Then Derek Bell, Al Halbert did it twice in 86 and 87, and Jan Lammers in 88. So Mike Rockenfeller can do this. It'd be one of only five drivers ever to achieve that feat. You bring up that schedule for next year. You know, we finished second to Rockenfeller this year at the Daytona 24 hour. And we were getting down to the end, and I'm pushing hard, but we are also thinking of points. When you get into this race and you just focus on Le Mans by itself, you don't think points at all. If you get that tied together with, with a six, seven, eight race global series, then, yep. then that does really change the scope of, of how you could approach this. It's a very good point. That being said, it's still Le Mans, and that's it's the one that you want. But it's and it's double points yes. for that Intercontinental huge, Cup, so yes. that's going to be exactly. huge. But that will come into play. Here yep. it doesn't come into play at all. It's like, this is go, got to go, got to go. Last lap verse was four seconds faster, exactly four seconds and two thousandths of a second faster than Rockefeller, and that is going to make it awfully tight. I worked out the Suns with three hours to go, and we're at two hours fifty-eight. If you were four seconds a lap faster, you would gain that one lap. So Rockefeller and Verts are both driving their cars absolutely flat out. Body work going on the number six, so he'll. Yari behind the wheel of that Orica aim. The other thing that's going to come into play, which I haven't been able to quite figure out yet, just coming back, is the pit stop cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, how, you know, does that going to, wow, there's the 15 car. Olivier Last Jarvis. time through, they both pitted on the same lap, Scott. So if they're running the same amount of laps, I think they're both going to need four more to get to the finish here. Well, the question, too, is where on the lap is he behind? Mike Rockefeller, obviously, he's not right behind him on the racetrack. Is it a lap and three quarters? Is it a lap and a half? Is it a lap and a quarter? How far back is it? I think Rocky was kind of leaving his pit box as uh, Verts came in that was fuel only. So I think he's probably, I'd say, a lap and 30 seconds yeah. behind. Yeah. And that's getting clicked off at several seconds a lap. So you would expect here within the next, I don't know, 10 to 20 minutes that he would be there to try to get his lap back. And then it's a matter of being able to get all the way back around and get back up behind Rockefeller yet again. The onus sure is on, on Peugeot for sure, because they have got to run that blistering pace to even have a shot at, at going for the win. Well, we saw the problems for Frank Montagny on his car with the massive explosion out of the exhaust pipe. They'd been running it really rich, trying to get power out of that Peugeot power plant, and in the end, it would not survive. Will Alexander Wurtz have that same problem? Will they have the horses to get it to the end? Will the lion roar again here at La Sarth, or will Audi take back the overall victory? We'll find out. There's a look at your P2 class leaders. We'll be back to Le Mans. Right on board with the overall leader from Le Mans. No, that's not, that's the seven car. Sorry about that, it was Tom Christensen in the seven. They had their problems early on, running fourth right now and working through GT2 traffic. That's the 95 in front that uh, Giancarlo Fisichella had the problem with while they were running so well. The brake issues into Indianapolis and, you know, very, very good heads up move on Fisichello's part if you go back to that crash to say, I'm taking the escape road here instead of sticking it in the fence. Did, he, did we talk to him after the incident? Is that what he said? Yeah, he said he had a brake issue. Looked to me when I first saw that maybe he'd got his foot on both pedals at once. Now, that's, you know, Dorsey thought it was, oh, and look at this, McNish. <laughs> TK, really a tight moment there. Went one way and then the guy pinched him. It hasn't been his favorite part of the racetrack. <laughs> oh, no, <it> <laughs> Tom Christensen. <laughs> few meters up the road is where he got into it with Andy Prio. I to pull my glasses up a little bit more. I saw the white helmet and immediately thought it was Allen, but uh, with the red and the, the feathers on the side of it, definitely Tom Christensen as Dindo Capello looks on. That yellow rollover bar there above the driver. You can see the yellow mirrors and the rollover bar from a distance. You know that it's the seven car. Tom ran the fastest lap of the race in this car just a short while ago, a 321.9, so just dipped below that 322 barrier. When we think about the pace, 
Alexander Wurz has run a 319.241, which eclipses the previous race lap record and is now only seven tenths off the ultimate qualifying lap records set by Sarazan a couple of years ago. That is impressive. And there's a look at Nicolas Lapierre and the uh, Orica Peugeot. Having a good run in the top five, holding down the fifth spot right now. Another hope for Peugeot if there are problems up front. And you've got to be impressed. This team got the car back in January. So when you think about the experience that the Peugeot team has with the 908 versus what Hugues de Charnac and his boys have, uh, pretty impressive that we see the performance. And uh, speaking of performance, a bit of a lack of performance for the 26 right now going back into the garage. They'll check the water a level again, I assume, and see if they can get Marino back out. Justin? Yeah, that's exactly it. Marino just, you know, he just had a, I won't say he rolled his eyes, but he had a little resigned sort of, well, let's try something else as he looked at me through, uh, as he put his visor up. Um, you know, there's no rush, there's no disappointment now. They're past all that. All they want to do is learn and uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. And they're a smart team, you know, the drivers are so committed, pretty much, or well, David and Marino, uh, David's here watching Marino do what he needs to do. And, uh, you know, really amazing group effort here because, you know, this is, as, they, as you know, the Stracker car has done two races with this aero package before, and that showed and uh, in the pace they were able to run. And certainly I know Duncan Dayton's been very impressed by the Stracker guys. And likewise, the Stracker guys know and respect the performance abilities and record of Highcroft. So uh, a lot more data being gathered here. They're looking at something in the rear of the engine. And, uh, you know, it's not about performance now, is it, uh, Scott? It's about getting data so the next time they're out, they can make sure this kind of stuff doesn't happen again. Especially with these guys running for a championship in ALMS, every bit of information, the fact this is the first time in Le Mans, getting a good look at what's going on back there, coming back. and Because part of, part of this is also learning about what do we do for next year right. to make sure we can go the distance? What weak links do we have? What issues are there that, that we need to get resolved? Is it electronic? Is it, is it mechanical? Is it something that we've missed? Is it something that needs to be redesigned? I think the other thing is, is we see one of the GT2 cars there suffer a tire blowout. I think that's the 75. They have not had a good day. They've been off at Indianapolis at least twice. And now left rear tire failure. So they'll limp it back to pit lane, running well down in the order. You were saying, Calvin? Yeah, I think one thing that the boys from Highcroft would definitely like to do is see that checkered flag yeah. here today. I mean, it's a long way to come as Duncan Dayton's first time as an entrant here. He's uh, driven here before, but as an entrant and for Robin Hill and the boys, their first time here. They want, do not want to see a D DNF on the, in the record book from their entry this year. They did a great job. They've been very quick. Certainly, we're looking off for a podium finish here today. And uh, they'd love to get the 70% and uh, get to the checkered flag this afternoon. Well, this event is so important to Duncan Dayton personally and to this team. You know, Dayton, a racer, a good racer in his own right. Uh, had ten wins at Monaco. That's and, right. Uh, he got two I mean, this year yeah. in two different classes of ten wins. Winningest yeah. driver at Monaco. Yeah, that, that's saying something. <laughs> and uh, in, certainly in the vintage rakes, he gets the job done. He used to get the job done when he raced in sports cars. And his quote, about Lamar was getting an entry for Lamar is extremely satisfying. It's been a goal of ours since the creation of Highcroft Racing, preceding our relationships with both HPD and Patron, winning our first race or even the championship. So this has been a goal for a long, long time since the inception of the team. They've seen part of that goal come to fruition. They are here. And as you said, Calvin, what they really want to see is the checkered flag. Yeah, we see Reinhold Yost. He's really been the mastermind behind so many victories here. I think he's been involved in 10 victories over his years, dating back to the early 80s. And a big smile on his face as he can see potentially another one to add to his amazing record here. Segment E6 car is back out there. They lost many laps having the car in the garage. They look strong for podium finish until some problems early today. Right now, Mike Rockenfeller continues to hold down the point, but Alexander Wirtz still laying down the fast lap times, 321.8 last time, so still maintaining that three and a half to four seconds a lap faster. Will that be enough to chase down the overall leader? There's a look at GT1. 
The 78 BMW, they have certainly had their problems today, but they are persevering as well, and that is one of the keys of Lamar. It is endurance racing, and right now they are trying to endure, and there is a look at the Peugeot of Alexander Wirtz trying to chase down the lead, and right behind him, the 89 Ferrari running second in the GT2 category right now, trying to chase down the leader. Lee Keen behind the wheel, and you can't say enough for this young man. What a season he has had. ALMS competition, Rolex sports car competition, running at the Nürburgring, running here at Le Mans, and the confidence that he has gained step by step by step, it really shows, and he's taking that confidence and doing the right thing with it. He's moving forward. Yeah, he's really put in some stunning performances of late. I mean, a lot of people looked at his championship winning effort in the GT category, the Rolex series, the Grand M Rolex series last year, is that he's really just uh, on Dirk Werner's uh, coattails. But when you look at the lap times and you analyze last year's data, in over half the races, he had faster laps than Dirk. And he went on a tier mid-season with a bunch of poles. And uh, this year, switching camps, a couple of podiums to his name, and uh, just some stunning performances. And he's just gone from strength to strength. And he says, I'm just gaining confidence every weekend. And he certainly developed himself into one of the leading GT runners. The more you're in the car, the more you're going to learn, what, no matter what co continent you're on. And, and that's one of those things that, uh, you know, as a driver, you, you want to you know embrace those opportunities take advantage of those opportunities and especially when you're with a great team they don't just raise you to a new level all the time you play to that next level if you get involved with great teammates there's things that they'll teach you as absolutely. well absolutely i think that's what dirk Werner did i mean he yeah. made lee Keen step up to his game he said listen i'm going to be your teammate but you've got to do these things i'm not going to put the effort in if you're not going to put the effort in and i think lee used to play a little bit too much i mean he wasn't taking it he loved his racing but he wasn't willing to put in the dedication in the training room he wasn't willing to be there and uh, go through all the debriefs like he needed to and uh Dirk obviously got him on track, and then he realized, hey, I can now compete with these guys if I put in this sort of effort. Reuter now on pit road, and the Peugeot flashes by down the front straightaway. Justin. It was they were ready for the number four car to come in, and uh, is cleaning it up, really, guys, putting fuel in, and uh, about to head out. So uh, obviously, you know, Hugh Deschonac's number four car is is been having a very solid run and uh hugh at this stage i know what he's telling his drivers if you think he was hard on them at the start of the uh drivers briefings for these guys by now he's almost paranoid so uh, but it's not a bad habit not a bad team boss to have someone that leaves you in no uncertain doubt and i've i've heard um scott talk about it throughout the whole 24 hours about discipline and and how to manage yourself and manage your car well, Scott, this guy, Hugh Deschonac, is, uh, is rules with an iron fist. And even though, you know, now he's in, you know, he's obviously got his fourth, you know, Peugeot here, and he's never really been a, a top, G, you know, prototype uh, fact, uh, team manager and team owner. Now he's certainly putting himself in the position with that three-year deal to become one. And uh, I think they run one of the best teams in the world. So I know these drivers are under really strict orders now. We have to finish, and if we finish, we'll get a decent result. And uh, Hugh, literally, I've seen him pull, and you mentioned it earlier maybe about him pulling Soleil area aside. He will have done. He will have written, pulled him aside, and he could only yell at me in English, but in French, I think he's a bit more <laughs> gracious. So uh, uh, I, I, could, I could always go, uh, je ne comprends pas, mate, but he, uh, he would hammer me. So, um, But you didn't need him to say the words. Team managers somehow have got this way of looking at you with their yeah. eyes and make you feel like a schoolboy. I was going to say, so, it doesn't really matter what language he was speaking are, either. Right, Scott? And that's what the you know that's a situation no, where we talk about some of these drivers coming in from other disciplines where it's always make it happen now make it happen now formula one uh is is the premier level where you're trying to make something happen right this minute when you get into these cars you got to drive them hard but you got to think you still got to have a good car at hour seven and hour 15 and hour 20 and hour 24 and you can't just just run this thing into the ground you got to make it the checker 24 hours is a long time Verts flashed by moments ago while the eight car was on pit road. Timing and scoring will have to cycle through at the end of this next lap, but by our calculations, Calvin, Verts back into second place. Yes, he is. Uh, once we see the timing and scoring cycle, he should be showing Verts up to second. And he's certainly eaten into Rockefeller's lead. Last lap, he was two and a half seconds faster, but that's not going to get it done. 
Everyone's getting traffic, so even on a slow lap, he's still a little bit quicker, but. When you're running at a, at a, you know, you're really trying to put qualifying laps together, traffic affects you a lot more than when you're, when you're running a solid pace. So when he gets down into the, you know, 319s, 320s, that's good clear laps. As soon as he gets jammed up a little bit, you know, maybe going through Porsche curves or or, or, uh, or Nage or whatever the case might be, you know, he loses, you know, three or four seconds a lap. And so he, that differential, I mean, he, they're trying. Um, it's going to take some luck. I think Robin Hill said to uh, Marino, you can get out, <laughs> mate. Or, and I think Marino said, no, I'll just take a nap here and uh, tell nice me when we're ready to go. Where it's comfortable. It fits me. <laughs> Things are good. Getting back to this situation right now, we now see on the timing score, Inverts is now officially in second spot. Think about the pressure on Rockenfeller. For Verts, it's just flat out. Maximum attack. Rocky's got to keep the maximum attack going, but he can't afford to throw yep, it all away. He'll look like an idiot if he throws it away by taking a risk. So I think the task for Rockenfeller is a lot tougher than Verts right now. Well, Verts really has nothing to lose, does he? He has nothing. They're, they have one play. And Mike. All out. All in. Mike can lose it all. And Mike can lose it all. And this is where, as a team manager, you need to step up and and, and coach your drivers, drivers, all of them, to you know be doing the right thing, be doing a smart thing. Audi's been here so many times; they know they know what to do, and that's one of those situations where, especially as a as a driver uh, that hasn't been here as many years as some of the other guys, uh, you know, this is what you need to be doing. These are the kind of laps you need to be putting together. Don't take too many chances, but, but at the same time, you know, let's put that those good clean laps together when you can. So Verts get balked coming out of the chicane. As cars continue to cycle through their pit stops, two hours and 37 minutes remain here in the 78th running of the 24 hours of Le Mans. And we have a battle on our hands. It will all come down to this, basically the length of a regular American Le Mans series event. Back at Le Mans, the Peugeot just stopped the number one, and you see Mike Rockenfeller pull out a pit lane as well. Verts can see his prey in front of him. It's two laps that he'll have to close down to get back to the lead. And that is a long way to go with two hours and 33 minutes left. Yeah, it's a lap plus that gap that you could see as they left pit lane, which is probably about 20 seconds. And uh, the pace they've been running, I would have to suggest within three or four laps, Alexander Verts will be all over the tail of Rockenfeller. There we see the smoke again. Certainly they've got these engines on full rich, maximum power. Both drivers did 12 lap runs, which is kind of in the middle. We've seen some 11s, we've seen some 13s. 12 is kind of in the mid range in terms of the fuel efficiency that they're looking for at this stage of the game. Peugeot, their only play right now is to push that car as hard as they can, just short of tearing it up. Running hard laps, running qualifying laps, trying to cut that distance down. You can see, I mean, they can easily get themselves back on a lead lap here, probably within the next uh, 20 minutes or so. And that would leave just over two hours to get it back around and get the job done. So it is going to go down to the end, that is for sure. The question is, who will be in these two cars at the end? We believe Timo Bernard will be in the Audi. At the top of the screen, you could just see the Peugeot beginning to come into your shot. There is the four Peugeot running in fifth right now who's worked his way around Rockefeller. Yeah, I think we'll probably see Timo Bernard and maybe Marc Genet in terms of finishing this race off. But looking at the pit stop cycle here, I think they're both going to need two more full stops and then probably half a fuel load to get to the checkered flag this afternoon. And you, so, so you're also going to have to figure out when you want to do your tire change. It looks like these guys are now on their third stint on, on tires running right now. You'll do that next stop, you'll change the tires, and then you go to the checkered. The question is right now, Alexander Vert seems to have the better of Mike Rockefeller as far as lap times. When we go with Mark Genet in the Peugeot and Timo Bernard in the Audi, will that uh, gap stay the same? Will Genet be able to throw down the lap times that Alexander Verts has been able to do? That may be a decision that Peugeot have to make. I mean, Genet certainly runs some very strong laps in the middle of this race, but if they feel Anthony Davison may have a few more tents, but he's risking the car a lot more, that's a decision that those boys have to make. Boy, if that's the case, you certainly want to watch the end of this thing. That's for sure. We talk about Anthony Davidson and uh, his terrier-like attitude. He certainly has been uh, 
pushing hard around the racetrack today. That is without a doubt in the middle of the night. Trying to get past the Ferrari. Boom. Scott. <laughs> this is uh, this is why they're chasing right here. I mean, yep. if he would have just gave up a little bit right there, he wouldn't be chasing as hard as they are, chopping off, fighting a trap, trying assets. to make a point. And here's the big one. Uh, just helping a Corvette. This is already very tough, very tight getting through there. As you can see, the lower part of our screen, a lot of garbage on the racetrack. Fit in. Woof. Let's jump that sucker. Who needs to make it to the checkered flag? And I'll tell you what, the problems that they've had in pit lane, when we look at the total stop time, 30 minutes and 47 seconds for the number nine Audi, the number one car, 47 minutes and one second. So they've been in pit lane 16 and three quarters set minutes. That's how, you lose this, that's how you win or lose this race. They're trying to catch up right now. They shouldn't be in a situation of catching up. They should be controlling the race. Yeah, they should be three or four the laps if you look at that. And this car has been punished. Absolutely it's punished just pure today. Stupidity. And right now, uh, you know, Alexander Wurtz is having to wring its neck yeah. to try to make up for the problems that they've had. You're asking a lot from your drivers. You're asking a lot from the car. I mean, you're having to push this thing to the absolute <laughs> limit qualifying laps every lap where you see with just some some heads up driving you could have kept yourself out of that. Oh, I know we've talked about it before but a very different mindset between Janae and Verts and Anthony Davidson uh, you know taking the seat from David Brabham last year. Once again those three drivers in 2009 said no curbs not going to take big chances. We're going to be there at the end. They were they took the overall victory today. We see a very fast car but uh, a different piece of the puzzle sitting in the seat on one of those stints and what you end up with is extra time in pit lane problems and uh, now they're playing catch up. We talked about the, at the top of the show. I mean this these 24 hour endurance races. I mean they're sprint races but they're also endurance races. You do got to make it to the to the checkered flag the least amount of mistakes here. We're talking uh, almost 20 minutes longer in the pit lane for the number one Peugeot than the leading than the leading Audi. I mean, you can't make that up. No. There's no way you can make that up. And it's just purely through um, just some bad judgment calls on a, on a driver's standpoint. Tom Christensen down pit road. Two hours and 28 minutes left. He'll bring the car to its marks. And uh, we've already chronicled several times the problems that TK had uh, out there on the racetrack. Really one of those perfect storm things like we talked about trying to get a little help trying to give a little help and what you ended up with is that stutter step that you do on the sidewalk when you're walking towards somebody and uh, Tom Christensen is the one who paid the price. Looks like it's just a fuel and go for these guys and they're off. Christensen back underway and that's one of those from Michelin standpoint something they've done so well. Double stint triple stint. Even a few of the guys doing quadruple stints because of the rules at Le Mans. You lose so much time if you change all four tires especially with one gun right now in comparison to just fueling it. So many pieces of the puzzle must fall into place to take the overall victory here but class victories they're up for bragging rights as well. It's Mike Rockefeller and Audi who hold down the point but Alexander Wurtz and Peugeot they are on the prowl. We welcome you back to Circuit de la Sarthe for the final two hours and 24 minutes. Big thanks to our friend and colleague Brian Till who's teasing us uh, saying he's going to have a sleep now. So <laughs> <laughs> and a massage. We're envious but we uh, you deserve it Brian. Hi folks Lee Dippy along with Scott Pruitt and Calvin Fish Justin Bell and Chris Neville with you here to take you to the checkered flag and beyond. We'll have some post race coverage as well. Um, we've got the story set here haven't we. Can Peugeot make up that deficit and make it a race with Audi? Timo Bernhard more than likely will be handed the wheel to handle the pressure, the responsibility, and maybe, maybe enjoy seeing that checkered flag fly here at Lasar for the win for the R15 Plus. But we have got a lot of work to do. Remember, a regular American Le Mans Series race is two hours, 45 minutes. So we're really just into the opening stint of a normal ALMS round. And Alexander Burtz can see Mike Rockefeller right in front of him right now, probably about four to five seconds up the road. And he has got the hammer down. Last lap through, he only took a second off of Rocky. Both drivers stymied by traffic. But he can see him right now. There we see Craig Hampson, 
Longtime engineer at Newman House with Sebastian Bourdais. Great to see here, him here supporting his friend. And Simon Pagino oh. was to uh, the right of screen to Simon uh, to uh, Bourdais' left. And unfortunately, those two guys didn't get to see action here in the race. Pedro Lamy took the start of the race, the opening stint, and the car was retired before either of the Frenchmen could get behind the wheel. Lotter now slots into second because of the two pit stops by Rockenfeller and Wirtz. So there's a cycle going on. Where the Audi number eight and the Peugeot number one are swapping back and forth with that second place. But the real race right now is can Wirtz catch Rockenfeller? He can see him up ahead. I think there's a GT car immediately in front of him. And I believe Rocky is the next car on the road. And they're on the same pit stop routine right now. So this is just this is just going to play out right to the checkered flag. Well, that's kind of redundant, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but there's not going to be much mix-up as far as you know pit stops come up. Uh, the Dreyfus the car. These guys are saying, "Never give up. We will not lie down." This car has been in and out of the garage more times than you can believe. But the British slash American team are not giving up. And Wally Pirro behind the wheel right there and uh, making a little mistake there coming through the Ford chicanes. Back on board with Wirtz. That is Lauderer, followed by LaPierre. And it was a shame to see Andre uh, nose the car in it at Arnage, wasn't it? Because for this eight car and a big question mark above the trio of drivers in this car, how did they land this factory drive? Why did Audi Sport select these three guys over people like Lu Lucas Lua, etc.? However, the race was faultless for that number eight car until that point. They've done a superb job and there you see it. There is Rockenfeller, middle of our screen. GT car between he and Wirtz as they negotiate. This final set of corners on that front straight away. And within half a lap here, or maybe even less, Wurtz is going to be all over the gearbox of Mike Rockenfeller trying to get back on the lead lap with two hours and 20 minutes to go. We couldn't ask for it to be set up better. It's the last time here at Circuit de la Sarthe that we'll see these cars go at it. The R15 Plus, new for 2010. And of course, the Peugeot 908 HDI FAP in its fourth year of competition and its farewell year of competition. The new car will be out later this year. Peugeot Sport were remaining very tight-lipped about it earlier this week at the track, and that man there would not give up any details. They needed to get this weekend out of the way first, then they may start talking about the new car. Likewise for Audi. The four is shadowing the eight. The four being Lapierre, the eight being Lotterer. I think at this stage, looking at the rough math, about five seconds a lap is what he's going to need once he gets in front of Rockenfeller. He will need a five-second advantage on average to be right on his gearbox before the checkered flag falls again this afternoon. Peugeot's have shown so much speed. And lucky can't get it done. Sense. This is a long, this is a long way to go. Peugeot gets by the. Uh, Number eight of Lauder. Yeah, that was an easy move for Nicole Lapierre. And you'll hear lots more about these two young guys. A young German, a young Frenchman. And we'll see them in endurance sports car racing for many years to come for the big teams. So they've both done a really nice job. For Audi at the front, can this amazing run continue? Remember, they have won eight of the last 10 years. They're trying to make it nine from 11. It's an extraordinary record. Too bad the world feed didn't yeah. stay on the pass. <laughs> <laughs> mm. We are at the mercy of the world feed. Here we go, just to underscore that point of Audi's run at Le Mans. And remember in 2003, when Bentley won, it was essentially an Audi skinned as a Bentley anyway. Suspense. 
And here we go. We missed it. Alex Wurtz has got around Mike Rockenfeller. So he did it on the run to Indianapolis. Came out of Mulsanne very close. And uh, with that high top speed that he's been displaying here in the last couple of hours, probably easily made that pass. So right now, I think the math is five seconds a lap. Five seconds a lap is what Wurtz need over Rockenfeller. They're both on the same pit sequence. We expect two more full fuel stops with probably a splash, maybe half a fuel load needed to get to the checkered flag. So three more stops total for both cars without any drama. Two hours, 17 seconds to run. Chris, what do you have? Well, guys, you know, over the past couple years, we've talked about the tire compounds at Daytona, and it's really a different animal here at Le Mans because at Daytona, we've only got one tire manufacturer. Here, we've got multiple tire manufacturers. Also here, teams can choose a lot of different compounds, both slicks and wet. So I decided to come over to the Michelin tire compound. This year, a little bit different. In previous years, it was closed to the public. This year, they've opened it up. They want all the fans to see what's going on over here. They have kind of a fan area out front, and then people can come back to the actual compound and see these guys working, changing out old rubber and putting new tires on. So let's go into the tent here. What they've got is two big tents, 2,000 square meters of tenting for all of their personnel to work. Michelin has about 100 people here working logistics tire fitment and then engineers they've got 34 cars in the field so for those 34 cars they need to bring 6500 sets of tires on the slick side teams are going to choose from soft medium and hard and then on the reins they've got to deal with full reins just kind of a normal rain and then an intermediate tire so up front these are tires that teams have already brought back they've already pulled the wheels off of these tires and you see uh, some of the Michelin personnel working on that here pulling those tires off it's a little bit slow up here now because obviously we've had some attrition in this race so uh, you know just a few teams bringing some stuff back looking for some new tires and uh, we've got everything working up here the way that they set it up they've got GT1 GT2 and then over on this side we've got another area for GT1 but then mainly all the LMP cars Cars, LMP1 and LMP2. All the new tires, we have to go to the back uh, tent back here. So we've got about another uh, thousand square foot tent or square meter tent, I'm sorry. And this is where we hear all, or see all of those tires, those 6,500 tires. Still a lot of new fresh tires back here. A lot of rain tires because we haven't had any rain running in this race. So a lot of rains left over. Um, just, you know, really what Michelin is trying to get out of this. Over the years, their focus has been trying to get teams to run more stints, make these tires more durable, allow teams to go two, three. We've seen Audi in this race go four stints. We see that in the LMP cars, but in the GT cars, typically two stints. They're still trying to push those teams further. We might see three stints in the coming years. A GT car is going to slide around a little bit more, so it's going to use up more tire out there. What happens to all these tires when they come back? Well, Michelin just doesn't throw them away. They want to recycle them. So they grab all these tires, they analyze them after the race, and then they go to be recycled. What, what are they going to do with them? Well, they can turn it into the soles of your shoes, some of the rubber flooring out here, and also some of it can be turned into fuel that they use at cement factories to make cement. So Michelin not only trying to get the best out of their tires on the racetrack, but also when they're done racing with them too. Great stuff, Chris. Interesting. And of course, Michelin's headquarters southeast of Le Mans, down at Clermont Ferrand. And Chris, if you see any little fit of VW Touareg over there, just <laughs> slip them in your bag, mate. <laughs> so unfortunately, the French director forgot that there was a race going on at the front. We missed that pass, but we can confirm that Wurtz is now on the lead lap, the same lap as Mike Rockefeller. This is what it's all about. The title fight, Audi versus Peugeot, it is on. We welcome you back to Le Mans, and this is on board with Alex Wurtz. It is all over. Just when he got onto the lead lap. The number one Peugeot is done. Wow, astonishing. We just think there was an outside chance that this car could catch the number nine Audi in the final couple of hours of this race. And suddenly it has all changed right in front of us as Alexander Wurtz looks like he's having similar issues to what Montagny had just a few hours ago. There is Alex. Boy, that didn't sound good at all. I don't know if that's engine or transmission, but whatever it is, it's 
it's put the end to their day of yeah. any chance to put it in victory lane. Saw smoke initially coming out the side. That just may have been the engine loading up and then clearing out as he came through one of the slow corners through Indianapolis. You see it again. Heartbreak for they've Peugeot. Had, they've had to push this car so hard, yeah. qualifying lap after lap after lap after lap. It's engine. You see the smoke pouring out the side there. Justin Bell is standing by down at the Peugeot camp. Justin, whenever you're ready. Yeah, well, I'm right here because this is obviously the action spot right now. Looks like smoke kind of oozing out of the rear of the car, especially on the right-hand side. The dollies have gone straight underneath. They know it's got to go in the garage. We knew it had to go in the garage. And uh, I don't know, I think the diagnosis will be uh, make the most of the last few minutes of your life here, I think. Um, I don't know if this is really going to go well for them, is it? Of course, obviously, eagerly being watched down there by Audi, I'm sure. And uh, Rocky right now will be... Look, just look at the floor here. Look under the car. Look where I am right now. If my camera can turn around. Is he there? Uh, I guess he isn't. Anyway, I'm standing in a pool of oil, guys. If anyone can, uh, my camera guy, I don't know if you can talk to him, can turn around. I'm standing in a bed of oil right here at the back. So obviously it's completely let go. You can tell by the Maybe you, you called it, maybe it was. Uh, everyone's standing here. Look down here, look. This is it. It's the uh, final Peugeot blood has been spilt at Le Mans this year. And um, I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Three of. Three amazing cars, beautiful cars, uh, and incredibly fast should actually not make it. It is amazing. At the start of this, we thought we would have uh, seen an Audi's right at the, you know, at least two of the top three spots. But anyway, back to you guys. I think the uh, when you see an open wound like this, it's all done. Well, for those who saw it on track, they will know immediately. For those who didn't, the word will go out to Mike Rockefeller, Andre Lotterer, and Tom Christensen that the one is out. And soon it will be an Audi one, two, three. Interesting, the same right side bank as what happened to the other Peugeot. So that's always the concern when you have one car go down. Could it be the same problem with any other remaining cars? And it looks like very easily this, this could be. And they just had to push so hard this year in comparison to last. And Interesting reaction here from the Audi camp. Looked like Dr. Ulrich was almost disgusted. I think he was looking forward to this he battle to fight, here. Yeah. He wanted to go right down to the flag. He didn't want to see the print in the media saying that the Peugeot's broken out. He's won. He wanted to see that that car finished. But nonetheless, a stellar day is in store now for the Audi squad. There is still one Peugeot 908 out there. It belongs to Team Orica. Hugh Deschonac's operation. It's running in fifth at the moment. It will be pushed up to fourth due to the DNF of car number one. But it's not in play. It's not in play. Now for Audi, they just got to set their pace to the checker. They're in great position to do a one, two, three. No reason to take any chances. Run smart. Bring it home. What a shame that was building. Mm such a finale to such a dogfight for the final two hours and this is down at Arnage this is where it all started happening we saw the car kind of coming slow out of uh, out through there and it looks like there that is the debris flag for for something on the track which could be oil or should be oil probably is oil from for the Peugeot and how much can change in the space of 12 months this time last year, that man there, Olivier Canel, the boss of Peugeot Sport, was biting his nails. He was watching every lap. And their car, with Janae, Brabham, and Verts, led the last 15 hours of this race to go and clinch the victory. They were trying to do what they did in the early 90s, 92, 93, and win back-to-back -back years here at Lasarth. We now know for sure that is not going to happen. And you could see there, Olivier Canel was like he was texting someone and you could see the emotion in his oh, face yeah. as he was punching in the words to say that it's over probably to a certain board member board members i would suggest who are eager to know did we beat audi once again they came so close they had the fastest cars here today but it wasn't to be audi pushed them hard and ultimately the persians broke there you see the tears from the man in charge 
You ask so much from that car. When you get behind and you have to run qualifying laps, after lap, after lap, after lap, you're asking a lot from, the, from a race car. I don't care what kind of car it is, hour after hour. And unfortunately, it just wasn't meant to be. Well, the buck stops with those guys, with Dr. Ulrich, with Olivier Canel, because they are the ones that have to go back to the board and answer the questions. So we invested this, and why didn't we win? They're the questions that those men have to answer, and they're not easy questions. There is Hugh Deshonak, a dear friend of Olivier Canel, and Canel is a big supporter of Deshonak, and that is the sole remaining 908 in this race. There's so many what ifs in this race. I mean, certainly they've had engine problems with two of the cars. They had the chassis issue with Lamy's car in the very early hours. But also for the number four car, it has run a great race other than that half shaft. You know, it's still got to run two hours here. Hopefully it won't succumb to a similar engine failure as the, the factory cars, but they have been super quick. It could have really been in the battle to be leading this race right now without that drama in the middle of the race, changing that half shaft and taking the car to the pit box. We're going to go back to the replay, the onboard replay of Alex Wirtz and those final moments. We're off to a break, but here's what happened. Hundreds of restored and rare cars will be auctioned off to the highest bidders. We are talking about Barrett Jackson. This, of course, is the world's best and greatest collector car auction. It's here on speed, and it's from Orange County this time round. Coverage begins Friday, June 25 at 5 p.m. Eastern, live here on speed. We welcome you back to Le Mans. And this is the sole remaining Peugeot 908 for Team Orica as it heads out of pit lane one last time. One pit stop closer to the end of the French Classic. And car number four now moves into position number four, courtesy of the stranded 908. The final one for the works to a Peugeot team, the Peugeot Sport Organization. It is out. Alex Wirtz bringing that car back to pit road. It's in fifth on total laps done. But there's a good chance that Sam Hancock will overtake that car and put the 009 Aston Martin into the top five. Aston Martin finished best petrol car last year and in the top four as we welcome Dorsey Schrader back to the booth. Dorsey, can you believe what you see? Unbelievable is right, you know, and that thing sounded terrible. It sounded like a bunch of bolts in a blender, you know, as he drove it back. I think the only reason he drove it back is so he could go to bed now. He didn't have to walk. <laughs> you know? What a heartbreaker. Yep. I mean, that's, you know, they were pushing so hard there at the end. I mean, that's a lot to ask from a car. Yeah. No matter no matter what the situation, but you know what was going to turn into just an unbelievable fight to the finish. Now is I learned something though. I learned that 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 diesel oil in those race engines is as black as mine is in my bus. <laughs> <laughs> it gets dirty just like mine does. Looking at the emotion here amongst the Peugeot crew. Yeah. What a shame. You know, when they go, they go, but you hate that when it happens this close, two hours from the end of the race, and you work so hard all throughout the week, month, whatever it might be. And it took away a fascinating battle yes. for everyone sitting at home who's followed this race. I mean, we're excited here in the booth to be thinking about could the Peugeot do it. It was it was a long shot. They really needed to dig deep. They really needed Rocky and maybe a little bit of a hiccup, but um, it was going to be awfully tight at the end, certainly yes. within a minute, I would suggest. Scott, it happened to you this year in, in kind of a similar way at the Rolex 24 at Daytona where you were headed for yet another victory and just a little hiccup with one of your co-drivers and that victory eluded you and it was snatched away from you very quickly. How do you deal with it first and foremost? How do you get over it or maybe you never get over it? You, it's, it's very difficult. You know, it's, I guess, exciting for, for the Ganassi organization that we've finished every lap of the Rolex 24 for the last four years. Unfortunately, the last two years we finished second. We had the race in hand this year. And it was just one of those things that, that, that came together within in, in a wrong time. We thought we had a vibration in the car. Justin uh, was driving at the time and, and just a little bit of inexperience on the stand because of uh, uh, the team manager, T Timmy Keene, was was off using the restroom. And and uh, they, they, they made the call that they, that, that they could. It happened going through the bus stop and this horrible vibration and had to, had to call in and take a look. 
you know, we talked about that too, how, how fate plays into these things. That had that happened anywhere else on the circuit or even, even 10 seconds later on the racetrack, he wouldn't have had the choice. He would have had to exactly. do another lap and there would have been nothing wrong and, and of course you'd have got the win. But that's that's the fate of these things. Lead GT2 car in, Wolf Hensler at the wheel and the 77 Team Felbermeyer Proton Porsche has been superb. The nine Audi is in. This is the race leading car. Chris, talk us through. Well, when you guys are talking about the Rolex 24 this year. Mike Rockefeller, who won that race, getting out, strapping Tino Bernard behind the wheel. You know, it was very interesting to see this team prepare for this pit stop. Uh, Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich pulled all the crew together and gave them, I guess, probably a little bit of a pep talk uh, as, we're, as we're closing in here at the end of this race. And you can see by his hand gestures, just telling them to stay relaxed, make sure you look over everything, feel all of these tires as the crew members just taking their time on this pit stop, looking everything over, making sure that this car can make the distance. Then as Timo Bernard came out from the back of the garage, Dr. Ulrich ran over, over to Timo, had a word with him, kind of patted him on the shoulder, and immediately Alan McDish came over to Timo and stuck his face right right into his helmet and you can see just told him hey this is your guys time you guys can take this thing to victory just a couple more hours to go be smart out there and uh, just waiting for the last tires to go on this car everything looks great the team really looked it over well and you can see Timo he's ready to get out there and hopefully let this clock run out and these three young men are all graduates of Porsche for Timo and Roman they are still contracted Porsche drivers. Mike Rockefeller at one point in time was a Porsche factory driver, now an Audi factory driver. He's sixth in the DTM standings at the moment. And this is kind of a reward for Mike Rockefeller for the years that he has had not the most modern equipment in DTM for Audi. He's been forced to drive that year old Audi. And it's been quite frustrating for Rocky, to be honest. This is a reward. This is a payback for his loyalty. I've got Rockefeller. And doing what is, has been asked. Chris, we hear you. Go for it. Yeah, Mike Rockefeller, he's got his helmet off ready. Mike, when you heard the news about the Peugeot over the radio, what were your thoughts? Well, actually, I was right behind the car, so uh, I was telling the guys that uh, the Peugeot was smoking uh, on the right-hand side. Well, of course, uh, to be honest, I wasn't... Uh, yeah, I was surprised a bit, but, I mean, he was going a speed which was unbelievable on the straight. And uh, now we just, you know, have to have to cross our fingers and just run our race to the end. At this point in time, you're essentially racing the clock. Do you do you start to ease back? Does the team tell you, hey guys, let's back it off to 85 uh, percent? I hope so. Um, if we have the chance, I think we should. Yeah. But uh, I just got out of the car and we had some vibration and hopefully it was just a tire. I think it was a tire. But just to be safe, uh, we should bring it home now. So you're saying there was a little bit of an issue at a tire you came in early? Oh uh, yeah, two, three laps earlier than scheduled. All right, hopefully uh, we'll see you guys up on the podium. One other thing Dr. Ulrich probably said was there isn't going to be a race in amongst our other cars. You're it, just, just bring it home. Absolutely, they got three, three Audis up front, three team cars up front. They're going to work together the, to the checkered flag. It is what it is at this point in time. Don't try and force anything. Let the time run out, be smart. Nothing would be better than seeing one, two, three Audi at this point for those guys. Danny Watts for the Stracker team is seventh overall in the lead LMP2 car. We know that Mark Lieb leads GT2 and GT1. It's still the Labra Celine. We'll be back. Speed's coverage of the 24 Hours of Le Mans is brought to you by BMW, the ultimate driving machine. Did you see that car there on what we call the billboard? That was the old BMW V12 LMR that was victorious here in 1999. BMW have had a troubled run on their return in the GT2 category. There is still one of their two cars running. However, they will be back. Oh, that was tight there for car number seven, Tom Christensen coming past the 75 Porsche. And you hook the Shonak and his staff look tired and weary but they're an hour and three quarters away from completing it in their first run at Le Mans in a Peugeot work-supported 908. And their other car, the six cars, currently running six, second in the petrol-powered stakes, but many laps behind the 009 Aston Martin. So I think that first in class, as they like to call it, is probably yeah. out of reach unless the uh, Aston has some issues. 
Let's change gears and talk LMP2 for a moment because a name familiar to us all, a guy who won here on debut, is on the podium. Let's hear from Andy Wallace. He's with Chris. Chris? Andy Wallace standing by, getting ready to get back in for his last drive in the 25 car. Andy, this is your 21st start here, right? Yes, it is. And you, you won overall. You've won multiple times in classes. How many podiums have you had in those 21 starts? Well, I'd have to count them up on the list. Um, I've forgotten. I don't know exactly, but several anyway. But of course, to do that, you've got to have the right team, the right teammates and the right car. So I've been very lucky. Well, it looks like you're going to get a no another podium today. Over those 21 starts, you were here when they didn't have the chicanes. You were doing 240, 250 miles an hour in the back straightaway. Now they're essentially doing the same time around this racetrack with the chicanes. Tell, tell us a little bit about the evolution that you've seen over the years. Well, the first thing you need to know is when you're in an LMP2 car and one of those diesel cars comes by, it is staggering how fast they are on the straight. It's something like 25 miles an hour quicker than us. And that doesn't sound like a whole hell of a lot, but it really is when you're already doing nearly 200 yourself. Uh, it's pretty impressive. Well, the, the cars have got a lot more physical to drive than they were in those days. Also, pretty much, you drive them flat out. You're not worried about the mechanical side. If it breaks, it would have broken however you drove it, whereas in the old days, you had to look after the car. But now with modern panel shifts and, and sort of high-revving, buzzy engines, it's extremely busy. In the old days, each gear was a long pull. So I, I just think it's a lot more manic now. That's, that's how to describe it, I think. Well, you've had another good drive. You're going to hopefully get out here and grab another podium. So why don't you go get your helmet on and have some fun? I'll do that, but you never say you get a podium because it's not over till it's over. This is a very long race. Well, hopefully I didn't jinx you. No doubt that his mother and father-in-law, Max and Jan Crawford, will be watching from Denver, North Carolina. We say hi to the Crawfords, and your son-in-law's doing a good job. I'm going to go visit them tomorrow. They don't know that yet, but they might know it now. <laughs> <laughs> For Audi, now it's just pacing themselves, running out the clock, not making any mistakes, taking care in traffic. They have everything to lose at this point for, for doing something for doing something stupid, but those guys are buttoned down. They know what they're doing. Team order is going to be to just bring it home, be smart. Andy hit on a what I think is a key thing of the change of the cars and so forth, and that is how much more physical the the modern car is to drive than even, you know, not when I started, but even mid my career, um, these cars do things so much more abruptly. You know, they break harder than the cars used to break. They certainly corner much harder than the cars used to corner. With the advent of paddle shifters and the things that they have nowadays, the car itself is unbelievably hard on the driver, I think. And the nice part with the paddle shifts, you've gotten away from those forced yeah. over revs on a downshift and and on the upshifts, it's a lot better on the transmissions. I know that's one of the things they're considering for Grand Am for next year, trying to help uh, reduce the costs uh, on, on that side of things. And I think it's a good idea. I think there's an initial outlay that certainly the teams will have to invest in. But when you think about just one blown engine will pay for that. So why not go in that direction? It's modern technology is easily available and now quite affordable. Gearbox cost as well goes way down with the paddle shifter. You're not going through dog rings. You're not breaking gears nearly as much. The wear on everything is less. And with that, it's nice to see the ACO has enforced these rules at, at cockpit temperatures and, and putting some focus back. Yeah, it has gotten more physically demanding on the drivers, but at the same time, they've, they've been focused on, you know, what do we need for the drivers? And keeping the cockpit cooler like they have those rules that we've seen for the last few years of, of making sure that they're not getting overheated. I mean, because those cockpit temps, even within our cars, I mean, you can, they can be 120, 125 degrees, and that'll burn you down pretty fast. Yeah, we, we used to come out all the time out of the car with your right foot blistered. You know, your, your foot's burned, your heel's burned, your, your right outside of your knee from rubbing up against the transmission tunnel's burned. And, and, and the reaction back then was, well, 
you know. Toughen up. <laughs> Toughen up, yeah. We've just seen a sequence of shots of GT1 cars, and if you missed the news uh, earlier in our broadcast, folks, this is the final year we'll see the GT1 category here at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. This is the, uh, the uh, quote from the official ACO press release with eight GT1 cars here and only a couple on average in each Le Mans series race. The ACO has decided to no longer allow GT1 cars in the 24 hour. And there are numerous reasons given. Uh, there's another point to this. As a result, the ACO has created a GT endurance category with a single set of regulations in effect from next year through 2013. And the regula uh, regulations are based on 09 regs with some modifications. And we'll get into those uh, uh, technical specs later on. They have created a GT endurance pro like a professional category and a GT Endurance Amateur uh, division. And they're going to grandfather in some of the cars. They're going to make it a little more interesting, and they're going to pair it back to just one GT class. So the ACO always looking to refine things. And you have to say, they watch the American Le Mans series very closely and look at what the ALMS is doing and take the best from a little bit of everywhere. So those 2011 regs uh, being publicised just a couple of days ago at La Sarthe at the traditional annual ACO press conference. And we'll have more from the circuit when we come back. We know many of you turn on at different times, so let's bring you up to date right back at the start. Three o'clock yesterday afternoon, French time, and it was Peugeot 134. Unfortunately, Nigel Mansell did not see much of the race. He was carried to the ambulance, but later released and is OK. His two sons did not get to drive. And that was a deflated rear tyre that sent him spinning. And this was the biggest talking point in the early hours with Peugeot and Lamy and drama. Yes, yeah, something came adrift in the right front corner. Pedro had to drag that car back to pit lane. They looked at the monocoque. Too much damage. Game over. That was a shocking moment in this race for Peugeot. Sebastian Bourdais, the pole setter, never even got to sit in the race car today. And that's what we've seen ever since that moment. We fast forward to hour five. And check this out, Tom Christensen, the eight-time winner, and Andy Prio, a three-time world touring car champion, sh uh, champion, just a mix-up. Andy said I was giving Tom the inside line, and Tom had already committed to taking that outside line. And of course, Andy Prio had a flat left front tire. That's why he was so slow. And Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich screaming at Charlie Lamb from Team Schnitzer through frustration. Reese had such a great record going. They're going for their third straight 24-hour win here at Le Mans. And their seventh straight in Dira wasn't a big gearbox issues put them out. Jean-Christophe Bouillon in the Lola Rebellion, even though his headlights are ablaze there, he blamed it on an intermittent headlight problem. And he said they went out when I was in the Ford Chicane. I couldn't see where I was going, hence the spin. And that happened under a yellow flag condition. And then this. Frank Montagny, he had the race well and truly under control. At that point, Olivier Canel said, it's all over. Now that was in the early hours of the morning. And he said, we were done, but they weren't because a very, very determined Anthony Davidson had some pretty ragged driving. However, he was br brutally fast and he was brutal with some of his fellow drivers. Here, of course, the GT, our Corvette, gets pushed outside into the dirt in a big accident. And these boys work themselves furious to get that car back on the racetrack. Davidson was not backing down in his explanation. He said that was Collard's fault. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. He's a confused boy. And then this, Alex Wurtz. This is within the last hour. Oil explains the story. Three Peugeots down and out. Let's go to the Peugeot camp now and talk with a man we know well, so well, from the American Le Mans series. Yeah, I'm standing here with Simon Paginot, who at one point I thought maybe the dream of a young French driver was going to come true. I, I mean, Simon, your car was so fast. Your car, as part of three uh, the, the fastest three cars on the grid, your emotions now, the team is a broken team. It is. Uh, to be honest, it's... Uh you know, it was a dream, and it's a nightmare now. But, uh, you know, we worked really hard as a team. The old three cars did a great job uh, all year. We, we worked really, really hard, and I'm really disappointed for the guys. You know, it's you can see the tears in their eyes. But uh, we will come back and win next year. I just want to say thanks to all my American fans for following me and supporting us. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's great to see the support from America. On, you're so popular there, but all the time you've had this this very big second job back in Europe. 
I think, 11 30-hour tests and never an engine failure. So, I mean, nothing you can prepare you for the trials of Le Mans. Absolutely. It's a, it's a big disappointment. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of emotion inside me right now. It's just uh, we work so hard. I mean, we started testing in November last year, doing a simulation, 32-hour simulation, and we never had an engine issue, never had a tub broken like we did. And it's just, you know, we did two hours and the tub is broken. What can you say? It's just, it's Le Mans. It's one of the toughest races in the world. It's what make it, make it so magical. And in a way, we come back next year and work even harder and try to beat the Audis. We, we, they did an excellent job as well. So, you know, it's racing. You're going to take it, learn from it, and go, go from there. Well, Simon, I know we'll see you back in the States. I'm sure you've got people to see and talk to, but uh, we were so proud to, to see you doing it. So... Thank you, Justin. Next year. Thank you. And drama's here for the young driver Aston Martin team. It's slowing out of Molsan corner. This is the second place car. Nugart is behind the wheel. And they have one foot on the podium. Mm. The Luke Alfont Corvette of Jerome Pollican is ready to pounce and grab that second spot away. Now, Don't. there is a bit of drama going on here, Cal. Yeah, there is. We're on board with Dindo Capello, who currently runs third in this race in the number seven Audi. But we've been talking about the emotion within the factory squad and that they still have the uh, Orica car running out there. Well, that Orica car is now just a mere 24 seconds behind Dindo Capello for the final step on the podium. So there you see Hugh Deshaunag trying to get his crew pumped up because they are chasing down this number seven car, I mean, maybe that would be a small goal at the end of the day, but rather than an Audi clean sweep to get a Peugeot on the podium to it. Last afternoon. time round, Dindo had a 3.23.8. Loic Duval, the young star, a 3.21.4. If he keeps running lap times like that, he will eat into that 24 second margin. And this is what we saw though before with the number one car before it lost its engine when they really pushed it this hard, this late in the race. That's when we saw the damage done. Well, a second of the lap will get it done. And even though we only got a, an hour and 32 left, I mean, right at a second of the lap, and he certainly oh. got that pace, and look at him he fly through it. there. He's using all of the road and more. So he has got the word from Hugh Deshaunek, go for it. It's one of those situations, you, this is the race that they wait for all year long. No, no good reason to come away in fourth, try and go get third, try and keep chipping away as far as you can get up that grid. I think both of these cars will need two more pit stops to get to the finish. Normally an hour and a half wouldn't be that much, but when you've done 20, <laughs> you're already. It's a lot. They are pumped. There's some extra motivation within the Oracle team, led by Hugh Deshonak. They know what it's like to be a part of an overall victory and a class victory here at Le Mans. I remind you about speed.com, Le Mans extras. Get all the info, whether it's yeah. blogs, photo galleries, daily notebooks, feature stories, whatever you like. The key phrase, 24 hours, speed.com. Here's what's ahead later today on Speed. We kick it off with NASCAR in a hurry. And a little later this afternoon, 1 p.m. Eastern, it is the latest round of the Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge Series, and that was from Watkins Glen a week ago. And that series is certainly very entertaining. At the moment, don't forget NASCAR Race Day from Michigan. DW will be on the show today. There is Hugh Deshonak urging his number four and Loic Duval on, who continues to lap in that three minute 21 range. He is absolutely flying at this pace. He will certainly run down Dindo Capello. I think both of these cars will need two more stops here to get to the checkered flags. They're on a very similar strategy. So Alan McNish and the boys have got to be feeling the heat, Chris. Yeah, and Alan McNish, he's not, he's not willing to go and sit down. He's up here in the pit box just checking everything out. Alan, I know you're always wanting to win, but right now it looks like one of your other team cars is going to win. Does that still satisfy your appetite? Well, it's good considering uh, that we thought after qualifying, and I'm pretty sure all you guys and all the fans in Speed thought that it was going to be a Peugeot domination. 
Uh, not many people would have betted on the possibility of an Audi 1, 2, 3. Right now, though, the Orica car is catching us quite strongly, and so our focus is on that. But it's uh, fantastic that it uh, looks like it's came to us. Well, over the past couple of years, we've kind of seen this changing face of the Audi group bringing in the younger drivers. Does that give you a little bit like, hey, we're doing our job, we've taught these guys well, and, and now they're probably going to get the victory today? I don't know if we necessarily taught them or not. I think they did the job on their own. Well, you guys have done a great job, and hopefully uh, we'll see Audi 1, 2, 3 on the podium. Thank you. The reason he's not sitting down is he can't see anything if he sits down. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a comment from Alan where I said, what are your greatest and uh, attributes and your weakness? And he said that they're basically the same thing. I never give up, but on the flip side, I can never relax. He said, I haven't relaxed all all year long getting ready for Lamar. He said, it hasn't been pleasant, pleasant in the household. He said, I've been very antsy wanting to get to this big race and uh, hasn't turned out the way they'd hoped. But for Audi, certainly a great result is on the cards here today. Check this out again as Duval crosses the line. Yet another 321 lap. That's three to four seconds a lap. He's knocking off the Audi time. He's coming hard. He's coming fast. It's just a matter of time before he catches yeah. another seven Audi. And I think that's about as far as he can go. There's just not enough time left to uh, to do much more than that. And Dindo can't do anything more than what he's doing right now. He can't pick up three seconds a lap. There's no way. It wasn't that long ago we were saying the margin was 24 seconds. It's now 11 and a half seconds. Yeah, I think the question here is, do you need to be pushing this hard? You're catching him three, four seconds a lap. You don't need anything like that. So right. don't wring its neck. We've seen two of those cars break today by doing the same thing. Here is the RML car on pit road. We heard from Andy Wallace a short time ago. Headed for a podium. We wish them well. They've won here a couple of times in class. And a podium, while not the ultimate goal, it will be quite satisfying. Duval is caught in traffic. And the good weather this year and the cracking pace sees us on target for perhaps, well, certainly on this circuit, a race record elapsed. Last year was the largest. This is what they classify as circuit number 14, the various iterations of the circuit over the years. And last year, we logged 382 laps. We're already up to 373. We'll smash that. And you can see the gap there. You can see Dindo Capello going down the Mulsanne between the first and second chicane. And in that gaggle of cars we were just looking at was Duval. So he's very close. The gap now is just over 11 seconds. So he is like a Pac-Man goblin into that lead of Dindo Capello for the final spot on the podium. It's just a matter of time before he catches him, passes him, and then, you know, do you keep the pace? That, you know, it's, it's always interesting, the different team owners I've worked with over the years of, you know, some of those guys, they want to just, you know, the, the best thing they have to do is just put a statement, a period on how fast we are, and that could be what's going on with, with the four car once they get by the, the, the seven. Audi, or maybe once they get by the seven, they want to just bring her home and and finish third. It's it's you just you just don't know where the team owner's at and what you want to do. But you know, regardless, you'll get it done. In theory, once he gets by, which he will, there's no question in my mind about that. Um, that's really all the further he can go without something happening to the cars in front of him. At that point, I would pull him back if it were me to say. OK, you know, if the car's in front of your brake, you're going to get that position anyway, but you're not going to run them down, so let's not blow the thing up. Well, maybe we can get Chris to go down there and ask him. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. What's your plan? I think the four car will be pitting about four laps before Dindo Capello. So there you see Hugh Deshaunac looking at his stopwatch. Trying to figure out when he'll pull that car in. You know, that car's run pretty pretty clean with the exception of the drive shaft failure that sidelined it for, you know, and took it out of the running. Because if that had not have happened, if he hadn't have had that drive shaft failure in uh, replacing the corner on the right rear corner, boy, that car could be leading. Oh, absolutely. They've done a stunning job here. And there you see the gap. Dindo Capello flashed through the screen. And there's Luke Duval. But you watch the back of the Peugeot, and it's starting to twitch around a lot. So he's he's got it on the edge all over the place. I think this is the third stint on this set of tires. Getting pretty well with them, but that's such a penalty. If you change tires every time, you lose so much time in the pits. That's how much work that Michelin has done. Making these tires so you can 
double, triple, even quadruple stint. And that's, a good a earlier. that's a good point, Scott, because uh, Dindo may be able to get to the finish on the same set of tires, and if the four cars to take tires, that's going to cost them a minimum of 20 to 25 seconds to do that change. So they're both going to need the same amount of fuel stops, but maybe tires will be the critical factor here. Duval just lowered the bar again, three minutes 20 that last lap around. And it's down to eight seconds, even less than that now between Dindo Capello and this man here, Loic Duval, the reigning Formula Nippon champion in Japan. Well, you can see him now, and that's magic. If you can see him, then you can get him. Duval just about 30 minutes ago set the fastest lap of this race, establishing another new race lap record. Breaking Wurtz's time of a 3.19.2, he ran a 3.19.0, which is now getting within half a second of the ultimate fastest lap around here, set in qualifying a couple of years ago by Stefan Sarazan. Isn't that incredible how fast they've gone? And we've just seen spectacular weather for this whole 24 hour. I mean, this has been picture perfect for Le Mans. Typically, you're seeing some some rain come down at some point, but gosh, what we've seen has just been nothing less than spectacular. You Here remember they supposedly slowed these diesels down this year. It yeah. should have been a 40 to 50 <laughs> horsepower reduction and they're running stunning lap times. Well, it's just like Formula One, no matter what the uh, sporting and technical regulations are each and every year, the amendments, the changes, whatever the FIA hand down to slow Formula One down, the engineers always outsmart the rules and regulations. And the cars never end up going any slower. There it is. The hunted and the hunter. Capello and Duval. It's the German manufacturer up against the French manufacturer. Audi v Peugeot. Time on pit road is always a fascinating stat to look at. Cumulative time, that is. And look at the difference between seven and four. Look at the difference between four and every two Audis. Yeah. I mean, 32 and 32. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. And obviously the seven one is where Tom had the incident and uh, broke the rear bodywork. That's the amount of time they lost to their two sister cars. So they would have probably been on the lead lap as well without that issue. It just highlights the fact that if this car didn't have that half shaft problem, this car right here would be the race leader. No doubt about it. There's a good chance it looks like they're getting prepped for uh, for pit stop right here, right now. We'll update you on the other side of this, what Loic Duval is up to. I can tell you he's just come to pit road. The Orica is in. As we went to the break, Loic Duval brought the number four Orica Peugeot 908 to pit road, and this is what went down during the stop. It's come to a halt. Oh, the dream no. is over. The dream is over for Hugh de Schonach and Peugeot. And he cannot believe it. Unbelievable scenes here. Olivier Panis in the background. The same thing again. It's the right side bank. We're seeing smoke and flames coming out the exhaust on the right side. These 908s were pushed to the absolute limit. And all four have retired. And these displays of emotion just really help you understand how much passion is involved, involved in this sport, particularly this race. I mean, this race just takes so much preparation. The resources that these guys try to find, and there you see a massive explosion. Just short of 23 hours. And again, guys, you have to think they were wringing its neck again. You, you know, it's easy to you know, talk about it afterwards in hindsight, but did they need to be taking three, four seconds of a lap out? A second would have done it. Chris. Well, guys, I'm still up at Audi, and the eight car was just in before we see that Peugeot that blew up. So Brad Kettler was in the garage, and as he walked past me going back over to the pit lull, he kind of looked at me and gave me a little grin like, yep, now we got it, guys. Now we got it. What looks to be identical part failure on three different engines, you know, on the right bank. It does. They'll uh, they'll find that problem without. Yeah, all looks exactly the same thing. What's taking place with those three Peugeots? Let's go to the Orica pit now with Justin. You. Thank you. 
There are no words. There are no words. Absolutely. As you said, there is uh, no words because uh, we know that Le Mans is a real uh, special race, but uh, uh, I think that it was really too much uh, unfortunate uh, for Peugeot because uh, I know how they have worked, I know the job they have done, and uh, to lose the four car, it's uh, really uh, not a question of luck. It's, I don't know, it, uh, I cannot believe it. I cannot believe it. Uh, when you remember that at uh, midnight you are two car, two Peugeot leading, and at two o'clock, uh, you have uh, no more Peugeot. I can't believe it. And you have three, three already on the podium. I can't believe it. I mean, for Arika, the, the pressure, the, the weight, the expectation of France was really on you in the last, for the last two hours, which was an amazing uh, experience for you. And I could see that the Peugeot were giving you all the support that they could. And yeah. you shared in their pain, and now he just turned away and walked away. Yes, it was really uh, uh, great support from Peugeot, but uh, we are so sad, all uh, of them and, uh, and us, we, we cannot accept it. It's uh, incredible, incredible. Well, Lenny Prochen. Back to you guys. Justin shares a very special relationship with Hugh de Schonach. They won back in the 90s in class in GTS. Justin drove for Hugh de Schonach. Loic Duval, he is a superstar of the future. The reigning Formula Nippon champion. Boy, he put on a great driving display. But in the end, three of the four Peugeots giving up with a similar problem. Yeah, he really did, because when we spoke to Hugh earlier in the week, he said Lapierre is really fast. He will qualify this car. He looked really fast at the beginning of this race. We're standing the pressure from Alan McNish and all of the Audi boys. But for Loic Duval, this is only his second race here debuted in uh, 2008 where he also ran for the Orica squad so he did a stunning job and there's really a man to watch in the future in sports car racing broke the race record and as you said before turned the fastest lap of this race that will stand now for sure nobody's going to even gonna try to go at that kind of a speed nor is anybody capable also we saw all that going on down at Peugeot the leader of this race, Timo Bernard. This will not be his final stop of the race. Got it just over an hour and 10 minutes to go, so we'll need to see pit lane one more time today. But it is routine, and Audi's run one, two, three. You'd have to think the word is out. Just back off the pace, just bring them home, boys. Yeah, it's cruise and collect for Audi now. There's nobody that's gonna be able to do a thing. This is dejection. Trapped out on the circuit <laughs> with, you know, with one hour and 10 minutes to go, it's just, that's, that's beyond heartbreaking. The power that was available, Scott, to those Peugeots in these hours when they really needed to find some speed was incredible. To be running lap times around the 319 mark in race conditions is unbelievable stuff, but it is certainly taking its toll today. It's taking its toll, and it's, it's one of those situations where I, even if they would have backed down, I don't know if they still wouldn't have that issue because it was the same. It looks like the same thing on all three engines, the same right side bank. Uh, we saw it go up in flames uh, coming out the exhaust, that issue. So at this point in time, I'd say, you know what? They ran the pace they had to do, and, and they're just having some sort of, of problem that has caught three of their cars and, and sidelined them. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, when you, when you have a mechanical failure that is run all the way across the board, as this one appears to have done, you know, then you've got either a part issue or you've got a, uh, you know, some sort of a, a, a weak link to look at to be beefed up to be fixed so that doesn't happen again. You just cannot believe this. So much emotion. <sighs> Heartbreaking. This race means so much to so many people, and Hugh Deshaunac to have the opportunity to run a Peugeot here, a car that is capable of winning, is a very special moment. And uh, there's Olivier Canal who comes back to give his final condolences to Hugh on a job well done, but we just came up short. We spoke to Hugh this week, he said it's a three-year program with Peugeot, it's not just this year. If I was going to enter into this agreement, I wanted insurances that it would go further than this year, and he certainly proved 
his worth and his team's worth in having that commitment from Persia. We look forward to both those guys having more success here in the next couple of years. Well, from French disappointment to American joy, we will have an American on the podium so long as things go as is for the final hour. Right, Chris Neville? Yeah, you see all the emotion down there at that end of pit lane. And Lee Keen just trying to relax right now. But obviously, you're on pins and needles because you might be getting second in your first try at Le Mans. Uh, yeah, not a bad first try at all. The whole, the whole experience has just been incredible. This place is so special and, uh, and so difficult, too. And the GT2 class here is just the best there is. And uh, this team has done an incredible job. And the hand-cooked tires have been awesome. We've double sitted and uh, just been consistent. And uh, yeah, we're back an hour left or so. So we'll see what, see what we can do. Lee, you were just watching the images on the television there of, of all the emotion down at Orica and, and Peugeot. You, you just won the 24 hours of Nürburgring in your class. You, you might get a podium your first try here at Le Mans. I mean, do you understand the gravity of races like this, or are you just still a little too young in your career? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I came here over 10 years ago with my dad and, uh, and kind of saw a huge deal as a fan and, uh, of course, watching on TV. I really never thought I would be here right now at this point this early in my career. I always hoped, of course. Um, in Europe, auto racing is so huge. Uh, GT racing and road course racing, endurance racing, and uh, the Nürburgring and this race is just, I mean, I think this is the ultimate race uh, of the year, you know, for me as a fan. And to be in it and to get a, a good success, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> well, he's got a little bit uh, more than an hour to go, and I'm sure he's got lots of family, friends, team members, and sponsors back in the U.S. that everybody is just hoping to see him up on the podium his first try. Friends and family in Charleston, South Carolina. His dad, McGrath, is actually there at the track with him, so that is superb for the Keene family. And Lee Keene's star continues to rise and shine in endurance sports car racing. With a handy, comfortable buffer, Timo Bernard is comfortably leading this race over Benoit Trellier. But this is the most recent drama, and it's the end for any Peugeot-powered car in this race. Loic Duval, it is all over. Hi, my name's Alan McNish, Audi Sport Works driver. And I want to tell you today some of the differences between our 2009 Audi R15 and the 2010 R15 Plus Challenger. For Audi, motorsport and road car development are very much interlinked. And one good example of that is we're actually using R8 road car LED lights to show us and illuminate us the Le Mans track. And we're having to use these lights at 330 kilometers per hour. They have to be that good. The R15 already had a very distinctive nose section to the car. And for 2010, that has changed slightly, partly through regulations, where now we have to have one conformity through this area, but also through the safety factor. And as you can see, these very distinctive cones on the front, that's a crash structure. So in case of an impact, then the drivers are very, very secure. From the R15, we maintained the philosophy, but developed it even further, but in the line of efficiency. Now you can see from the R15 Plus, it's a little bit lower, it's a little bit sleeker. The lines are very, very defined, but clean from the front to the back, all in the name of straight line speed and better efficiency. Now we hear a lot about aerodynamics, but we can't forget mechanical grip and suspension. Underneath here, we've got all the suspension geometry of the car, and that also gives us grip in the corners, but it, they've developed it to try and enhance the ride quality over the long distances of Le Mans. Now, there's been changes from the R15 to the R15 Plus, all the way from the front and also to the back. Now, here is one, and this is a design area due to regulations. They sealed up this area so that you cannot see the rear tire, but the ingenious Audi designers, they've found the most efficient way out of that particular problem. And this is what we've got, a low sculpted rear end with a very, very nice defined strong section. This is the view I want all the opposition to see. Now, it's not just about car performance. 
Also, the engineers have been thinking very hard about the drivers as well, the ergonomics, the comfort of the seating position, but things like the steering wheel, where all the buttons and switches are, are they in easy position? Do you have to think about it? Do you have to look? Or are they instinctively where you want them to be? After so many years as number one, the, this Audi R15 Plus will start with a different number, number seven. But we believe the Audi R15 Plus can bring the number one back to Ingolstadt again. was awesome stuff from Alan McNish. The number one will be returning to Ingolstadt, but it will be courtesy of the number nine of Mike Rockenfeller, Romain Dumas and Timo Bernard. We're on board with Timo right now, and I'm sure we all have victories, whether it be in the media or as endurance racing fans, when we first saw these three young guys come to America, racing Porsche 911s. They were all blisteringly fast. They all came to America at different times. Most of them, their first event was the Rolex 24 at Daytona. We've seen them grow. That they came, particularly Timo Bernard, came to America in the shadow of then the Porsche stars, Sasha Masson and Lucas Lua. He was for a long time partnered with Jörg Bergmeister. It was the short and the tall of the story, wasn't it, between Timo and Jörg. And in more recent years, he's found his home and his mate, his good partner in Romain Dumas. So for them to share the ride with Mike Rockefeller, who had absolute embarrassment and heartbreak in his LMP1 prototype debut here at Le Mans a couple of years ago. This is a great story for these three young men. To Jamie. From one Porsche star to another, Wolf Hensler, Porsche factory driver, what would it mean if the race carried on as it is and the, the Le Mans trophy returned to Porsche? Yeah, I mean, for sure it would be very good for Porsche, but also for me it uh, would be my first win. Uh, and it's my third. First time I raced here was in 08, last year and this year again, so it would, be, it would mean a lot to me and for sure to Porsche. As an endurance star, how does the Le Mans 24 hour, how does it feel at this point in time compared to other 24 hour races? I mean, the, it's great to be here. There are so many fans right now that are coming on the grandstands and for sure uh, when we go through the finish, there will be many, many people coming and uh, I hope, I really hope uh, we stay on the lead. Uh, we are really driving very, very careful now. We have, uh, I think we are leading by two laps now and we drive really slow and uh, bring the car home. Have you heard anything from your co-drivers? Is the car okay to make it to the final stages? No, I haven't heard anything, but uh, that means uh, everything is fine. So if something would be wrong, I would hear it. But uh, I think everything is good. And I, I think he's coming in soon. Uh, and I'm not sure if Richard Leeds goes in or if Mark stays in. I don't know, I will see. All right, well, great job today and good luck to the finish. Thank you. <laughs> Wolf Hensler, a great guy and a super driver who we've come to know over the years in a variety of series here in the US. He loves racing in the United States. And what a moment for him. Third is a lucky charm. If it stays where it is, you couldn't find anyone more intense, more serious about GT racing than Mark Lieb. And Mark is driving the car right now. They're 12th overall. They do have a two lap margin over the uh, uh, Hankook Farnbacher Ferrari. So that is pretty comfortable there. And Richard Westbrook on debut in that BMS Scuderia Porsche is looking good for a podium place. That is awesome job for those guys. They've had some drama throughout the course. They didn't have a quick car. They had to keep trimming the aero out of that car to find some speed. They had some tire issues, but for that lead car, Mark Lee, Richard Leeds, they've had a GT victory here before, but as Wolf stated, it is big day for him. Oh, so a lot of smoke there out of the Aston. This what is a great story for the Aston guys right now. I mean, just because of being out there and staying what they're doing and staying the course, currently running forth with some of the issues that the Peugeot's had. Sam Hancock, oh, more smoke it's right there smoke. too. Yeah, there's a problem. It might have hurt itself coming off that last corner. We saw the smoke emanate there, but it, on that straightaway shot, right as we cut away, or we didn't cut away, World Feed did, more smoke. What we're going to do is squeeze in a commercial break now so we can enjoy more action towards the end of this race. And it is game over, it looks like it, for the 009 Aston Martin of Sam Hancock. They're in exactly the same position as last year. The lead petrol car and in fourth overall. 
but that looks terminal. Audi is in, lead car is in, Timo Bernard for the final time. 50 minutes remaining in this race. And all orderly for car number nine. Now they're not racing anybody but themselves right now, so no mistakes here, boys. No mistakes, and you probably just leave the tires on for one stent, pull them back off. You don't want to have any sort of issue with the puncture. Or I'm not sure you can go 50 minutes on fuel. They may still need to splash here, boys. That's about right, too, Calvin. You're, you're correct. I'm here. I wonder if he slows the pace down a lot, if he can pick up that extra mileage, Calvin, to, to get him past the 45, six minutes. And he's not really having to race anyone. His teammates are, are not going to pass. They can do a splash. It's not a, it's not a big yeah, deal. It's not a big deal. Rolling the pit. They've been doing about 42, 44 yeah. minute runs. So, I mean, that's a big stretch there. So, yeah. they may have to roll down and just top him up and send him. Yeah. No need to, you know, lean it out or anything like that. No reason to take any chances. No, I, I right agree now, with it's that. just getting to the finish. Okay. How exciting for Audi. I mean, one, two, three, potential in hand. I don't think I'd be touching any mixture buttons right now. <laughs> <laughs> Leave everything alone. Don't mess up the mojo. Uh, and th with 383 uh, laps in the books, car number nine has set a new uh, distance record for this, as we mentioned earlier, that is classified as course number 14, iteration number 14 of the LaSarth circuit. 382 last year, so it's already been surpassed with some 48 minutes, 57 seconds to go. While we're away, we just saw the beginning of this. And it was Sam Hancock in the 009 Aston Martin. We saw it puff a couple of times, and then it started, right as we went to break, emanating a lot more smoke. And fire. And fire, yeah. They parked it off, off circuit. So their Sam was smart. Done. He was looking for a fire marshal, I think full well knowing that uh, when, he, when he loses speed to the car, this could have caught fire. It never did. And Darren Turner was all kitted up, ready to go. Sam Hancock was set to bring that car to pit road and hand over to Darren Turner to finish the runoff for the Aston Martin squad. How about these boys? Danny Watts is behind the wheel of the Stracker HPD. They're as high as sixth now overall on what has been an amazing run for this British team. Based in Silverstone, and this was their big moment. They have been one of the standout teams in LMS competition in the LMP2 class. Nick Levendis was pretty hard on himself at Spa. He said, I made a mistake. I crashed early in the early in the weekend and forced a fair bit of damage on the car. But everybody knew the Stracker car would be quick. And let's stay on the Aston Martin theme for a moment. Let's check in with Jamie and Darren Turner. Darren Turner, obviously not a smile on your face right now. What was it that happened? Well, um, yeah, not too sure. I've got to speak to the engineers, but looks like we've got an engine drama. Um, it's come from nowhere. We've had no warning that there was a, a problem with the engine, and uh, it's just one of those things. We've done 23 hours, had a good pace throughout the night, and it was all looking good. We, I mean, we were all very relaxed behind here, and I was just getting ready to do the, the last pit stop and, and go out there and take the car across the line. Um, it's just feel very bad for the team. You know, they've done a great job the whole weekend, and we had some good pace with the car. And he's just said it all right there, but that is endurance racing, disappointing into it for Aston Martin Racing. Yeah, that is a gut-wrenching blow, I tell you what, to get down to the last hour of this race. I mean, certainly we've seen over the last couple of hours with Peugeot, who are going for the outright victory, but for the Aston boys, too. I That's mean, it. that is bitterly disappointing. You just can't put it into words when, no. you know, without being there. And I, I, unfortunately, I have been there in the closing stages and had a problem like that, and it's just, just a massive punch in the gut. You saw car 35. That is the... Uh, Pescarol, uh, Pescarolo chassis, Judd Power, Jan Chirou's driving. Then we pick up car 25, that is Andy Wallace. He is third in class. He Fine. is two laps down on the 35 uh, Judd Powered Oak car. So in no immediate uh, challenging position, four second spot in class. But Andy Wallace and Mike Newton and Tommy Erdos looking good for a podium. 
in another three quarters of an hour time. And and anything can still happen in the three quarter hour time too. We are seeing the attrition unusually high in the last two hours of this race. And you know, that could be, you know, we were talking about how great the weather has been. Because the weather has been so good, you haven't been in a situation where you've had much slowdown because of rain or fog or anything like that. And that does put these cars through a harder cycle than than typically what we see at Le Mans. Well, running more miles, you just said it, Lee, that this is going to break yeah. the mileage record. So the cars are going further than they've ever had to go. Well, the farthest distance traveled is 396 laps. That was a long time ago, 1971, with Helmut Marco and Gies van Lennep with 396. Now, the course configuration different, the course distance different. But this current configuration, there were now 384 laps in the books. They're going to be close to that. Yes. They're yeah. going to be right yeah. on that number, I think. And getting back to that P2 battle, we're looking at the 25 machine that currently holds down the third spot. I love what's going on with this 35 car. Jean Chirouz is one of the Renault development drivers. He's driving for Team Mazda France, and they've got a jet engine in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I work that one out. I want to know who that boy's manager is, because that, that is something that? else. It's a backroom deal making there. <laughs> it doesn't make yeah. any sense. It's been a good year for Judd, hasn't it? I mean, as far as the use of their engine on the different classes. And, the, and you have to look at reliability. They've done a good job with the engines. Absolutely. I mean, they've been around for so many years now, and uh, a lot of teams go away and try some other things, and sometimes they go back. As a We've seen it, too. Pretty sound engine. Just under 45 minutes left. For those of you just turning on, maybe you missed the uh, rest of the broadcast or either the online uh, webcast as well. Some of our American Le Mans series teams have had a pretty tough run. Both Risi Competizione cars went out, one with an engine problem, one with a gearbox problem. The Jaguar RSR went out in very early stages with electrical problems. The Flying Lizard Motorsports Porsche, it went out as well after one of the drivers ran off course and uh, had a drama with the radiator. Uh, which other American teams? Well, the biggest heartbreak of all in GT2 was the class leading car, the 64, with Emmanuel Collard behind the wheel. This car had the class under control, and there was a, an altercation with Anthony Davidson and the uh, then the flying Peugeot 908. The car was heavily damaged. The Corvette boys did a remarkable job to rebuild the entire rear end of that car, only to have engine failure after that, and that was obviously linked to that crash. So that was the biggest heartbreak of all. So the American teams put up a good fight. We do have an American in Lee Keen standing a chance of standing on the podium in GT2 in 43 minutes time. to win the reason why it is so revered the history is embraced on a global basis everybody knows what Le Mans is and what it represents to Chris Neville on pin lane Chris well we see Paul Drayson getting pushed backwards uh, just because there's a car in front of him he's gonna get the car back out on the racetrack this team moving up to LMP1 this year they've uh, had quite a few problems they had some vibrations in that car they had uh, fuel pump issues that they had to change but uh, it looks like they're gonna finish this year which is good and Dale White runs the team uh, Dale you, you you won GT2 twice last year you ran the GT program for Paul this year stepping up to LMP1 has it been a tough transition stepping up 
Oh, absolutely. We had all kinds of problems, you know, today at this race and uh, need to go home. I got a lot of homework to do, that's for sure, but learned a lot, learned a lot. Now, you brought in Manueli Piero at the beginning of the year, ran Sebring with you guys running here this weekend. A guy like Manueli, having all that Audi experience, what does he bring to this team? Well, he, he brings that experience, you know, and he's a pretty honest person, and uh, I'm the same, so we, you know, give each other pointers because I brought a lot of experience from GT and things that we learned and you know it makes a good team and gives us a little Italian spice which we need. So you're telling me that you actually taught Emanuele a couple things too. Well you know we both learn something every day I would hope yeah. Well this team I think they're excited because it looks like they're gonna see the checker flag we've got about 40 minutes to go so a uh, little bit better than last year they were running late in the race and then they had, they had that failure so they didn't get to see the checker. Guys and for some teams that open, openly acknowledge they don't stand a chance of winning overall, just getting to the chequered flag is a victory. Yeah, it really is. And uh, I was talking to Emanuele about this fancy new steering wheel that they're using for the first time. It's got a like an iPhone-type display on it. It's much shorter. And uh, talking to Johnny Cock, he said it really allows me to see a little bit better. He said I like to sit really low in the car, and the steering wheel sat very high. So it's got all these gadgets and stuff. And I said, Emanuele, what's it like? He said, well... He said it's like the iPhone, it's pretty cool, but with the steering wheel, it's got lots of gadgets, lots of things to play with, but basically I just want it to turn left and right like I need my answer phone to make a phone call, you know? Looks like they're setting up on their... Uh, yeah, they're getting ready for the formation the finish. The photo lap, yeah. Getting ready for the formation finish for sure. 35 minutes left to run at Le Mans for 2010, and it is an Audi show. 987, maybe that's not in the script for the cars to finish in that order with seven being the preferred car with the eight-time winner Tom Christensen in it. But hey, Audi, the Audi family in, of sports car racing since the R8 here at Le Mans. Well, the, a variety of family members have enjoyed victory, whether you it be take, Frankie Beal up. You take a great shot from above right now. You see they're not taking any chances at all. I mean, you can see in the way they're driving, they're just doing what they need to do. Not, yeah. Don't take any chances. They're getting the, all three cars together right now. Come on, Dindo, come on up here. Get in here. Hey, look at that. And I'll tell go. you what, they need to save about 10% fuel. We looked at the clock when Timo made his final pit stop there, or his last pit stop, should I say, and it was about 50 minutes on the board. So maybe they can get these diesel Dorsey and save that sort of fuel mileage. You need about 10% more fuel on this final run not to hit pit lane again. Or I wonder if they're going to get them on the same lap, you know, let, let, let them unlap themselves and then formation finish. That's a long finish. way to go because we're talking yeah, 387, 386, and 384. Chris, tell us more about the RML. Well, we're at that point where we're seeing all these final pit stops starting to happen. So it's starting to come alive down here in pit lane. RML here for their final stop. Andy Wallace just got out of the car. Mike Newton getting behind the wheel. He's going to take this team to the checkered flag. And, it, and it's kind of amazing. These past two, three hours, it got rather somber down here. So quiet. Most of the garage doors down. But in the last 15 minutes, it's like it's come alive again. I think these teams realize that the end is in sight. They want to get their uh, their cars out there, their cars cleaned up, and uh, and get this thing finished. So we've got some energy back down here in pit lane. Oh, polish the noses for the, uh, the victory shot. That's wrong. Just leave them dirty. Yeah, yeah I, I agree, agree with you, Scott. I yeah. agree. <laughs> I mean, one of the coolest things with the Grand Am is taking that car and put it in the, in the right out of the 24-hour race and sticking it in the museum for a year. You know, because then you can really appreciate what the car's gone through it's it's been amazing when i drove for uh for jaguar they would take the car right off the racetrack if, if we had won uh which we did a couple times and take it right to uh right to an auto show as as is and it was just incredible seeing these cars because there's nothing sweeter at least from a driver's standpoint nothing sweeter than than seeing these cars and what they go through and make them to the checkered flag especially if you can do it first Come the boys from Strack who have dominated this class, you'd have to say, absolutely dominated this race from start to finish, from qualifying all the way through. Superb job, and this should be their final stop of the day. Danny Watts behind the wheel. They crushed the competition. I mean, that wasn't even a race. These guys put it on the money, and, and they're running in fifth overall. After all. Isn't there a lovely family angle to this? Stracker isn't a product, it isn't a business, it's a family farm that Nick Laventis's grandmother owns in Cyprus. And it's a place that he grew up on. He visited a lot as a child. 
and he wanted to do that as dedication to his grandma Justin yeah the team very very excited actually I mean, Johnny Kane is uh, out on the pit wall Danny Watts pulling out of the pit lane for the last time you know they've been tearing out of here when they were in a head-to-head -head battle with with Highcroft now you know it's it's really doing everything in the most uh, economical and safe way possible and uh, you know last pit stop for a small relatively new team like this at Le Mans with uh, the title of LMP2 champion uh, winner at Le Mans uh, in sight is amazing and uh, you can certainly see that and I, I think that uh, you know when you watch this team and the performance they've had and the, the credit they got from Duncan Dayton by saying he was so impressed with them means a lot so uh, they're all in I mean but I have to say we did we missed um, Andy Merrick getting in the Eureka a minute ago and uh, but you can relate to this uh, guys over there that have raced and he said to me he said oh uh, Deshonex just asked me to get in the car he said for the last 45 minutes and he said it used a good old British phrase of which I can only use the last word which was I'm blank myself um, he said because considering everything else this end of the pit lane has disappeared he said uh, he said why did he ask me to finish I, I mean I'll enjoy the last lap but I'm not going to enjoy the next 43 minutes so uh, anyway he's, he's out there right now and um, you know a nice result for that car that's just been steady and made moved its way up hasn't it but as Chris just said the pit lane is still business because an awful lot can happen in 30 minutes but they're actually preparing not just for the end of the race and their cars crossing what it is is that they're making everything putting everything away so when the hundred thousand fans that do invade the pit lane they're not going to nick everything in sight guys good stuff justin hang in there mate only another 30 minutes to go and that number six orica aim is the lead petrol powered car and it's in the top four we'll be back Long straights and smooth roads define the track. The great teams that have won here, Mercedes, Jaguar, Ford, Ferrari, Porsche, define the history. And exhaustion, elation, hope, and fear define the experience. This is the 24 Hours of Le Mans. And as we see this display of Audi dominance, one, two, and three, we have the greatest at Le Mans on the line. Eight-time winner Tom Christensen has some headsets on. He is standing by. Hi, Tom. It's Lee Diffie in the speed booth here. Uh, it's not the way, I guess, that you guys may have wanted to win it. I think you were looking forward to a fight, but what a display from Audi. One, two, and three. Yeah, it's absolutely splendid. Of course, you can also say maybe we have been a little, a little lucky, but in many ways we were prepared to go racing with um, with a setup from Thursday night, and we have been uh, doing that speed and that pace for the in, for the 24 hours. Tom, probably the defining moment for you in this race is when you came across Andy Prio in the BMW art car entering the Porsche curves, and I know he didn't mean to do what he did, but certainly some miscommunication. Talk us through that moment for you. What did you see? How did you react? There was no way to react. He was going slow on three wheels. He had problem with the steering as well. He was on the right side of the track going into the right corner. And in, uh, in, the mo in exactly the wrong moment, he decided to go wide to let me go underneath. I couldn't. I couldn't commit different. I could, I could crash into him. Or I could go around the outside. And then the angle was wrong for the gravel. And I, I had to go off to avoid him. He, uh, he felt heartbroken. He, he's world champion. And um, it was his debut at Le Mans, and he felt much, much worse than I do. And he came up to me. I have the greatest respect for that. And to Dr. Ulrich and said he was sorry, he misjudged the situation. And you know, that's man and that's respect. And that's also what is at Le Mans. It's triumph, a tragedy. That was a little bit of a tragedy. And I am sure he will have a great future here. He doesn't deserve to come away feeling that heartbroken as he did. Tom Dorsey, you know, looking at that, we looked at, you know, speculation if you went to the other side, but there really was no choice. If you turned to the right, the car probably would have spun and impacted the BMW, correct? 
Yes, definitely. There's no chance because when you're committed to Porsche, I was already taking a bit of speed out to go around the outside because he was he was crawling on three wheels. But at just at the wrong moment, he turns left uh, and, and tried to open for me. But I'm approaching with so fast uh, speed anyway that you, I can't do anything. If I, if I had known, if he had an indicator, if just something, it would have been so much easier. But you know, what we know at the driver's briefing, you stay and commit at the line you are. That is the mutual respect between drivers. But anyway, actually, I showed Andy around the track on Tuesday night um, with, a, with a young driver from Denmark as well. They asked me to go around the track. So, so for sure, it was never meant to be. And it happened, and we both feel sorry. I feel sorry for Dindo. You know, I don't know how many Le Mans he will drive again, and for Alan as well, because we uh, we had a car which certainly was uh, was there challenging for the victory. But again, it's Le Mans, and I think we are proud to to have fighting it back in third position where we are now. Hey Tom, Scott Pruitt, let's get let's get back to the race, and and now we're getting into closing stages. Let's put that into context for a lot of the viewers. How big is Le Mans? How big is it for you guys? One, two, three with Audi right now. Just getting to the checkered flag. Put that, if you can, put that sense into some amount of words of how big this spectacle truly is. It's immense. I mean, Le Mans, you, the word, you can go wherever, where. you can even go on holiday to the smallest island. You don't know, you can mention Scott Pruitt or Calvin Fish, of course, <laughs> they would know who they are. But if you mention the word Le Mans, <laughs> Uh, sorry, Lee. But if you mention the word Le Mans, they they, they they all they all they all know what it's about. And for two of the biggest manufacturer and diesel manufacturer world, worldwide at the moment, uh, this fight uh, means a lot on that table as well. But for any driver, it's a driver's dream. It's your sentence. It's a driver's dream to win this because this is the ultimate challenge for man, machine, for the fans, for the press for the marshals, for everyone. And uh, when you're here, it's a motor racing festival. It's simply the, simply the biggest, and it only gets you there one time a year, and it's right now. Well said. Tom, what was your reaction? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on what occurred with Persia, with those three engine failures? It's, it's very tough. That is obviously the tragedy of Le Mans. And there's no doubt that they, they are completely heartbroken. And we, they were about to get very close to our third place with the Oreca car and Hugh Kunak, as we know, uh, he's also a lovely guy. And uh, when you see things like that, it's, um, it makes for brilliant TV, and, uh, but it's just something that you cannot be happy about. Because uh, you know, uh, in this situation, um, I felt yesterday we had the chance to come back but so shortly before finish, where the extortion is there and the potential of being on the podium with his own private organization, and then it's all taken away from him. This is something which is, uh, is unbearable. And again, it takes another year to get to. Tommy, as Cal Calvin again, uh, when you saw Rocky come onto the Audi sports car squad, you said that you saw a lot of yourself in him. And today could be his big day. Obviously, Roma Timo joined the squad last year. What are your thoughts of seeing these youngsters possibly getting their first overall Le Mans victory? Yeah, they will be. They deserve it. They, they're all good guys. All the whole team, and I think that is uh, also the three other guys in the, all nine drivers. We have a, a really good atmosphere, and I say that, and because people say how I feel about not winning. Look, we win today. We win. If it stays like it is, we win. And it's fantastic. It's a little bit like, imagine maybe an American soccer team is winning, and maybe it's difficult. But, they, <laughs> but you know, every, 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 everyone, is, uh, everyone is happy, but maybe the guy who scores the goal is a little bit more happy than the others. And obviously, I think that you will see in Rocky, Timo, and, um, and Dumas. Today you will see somebody is very, very happy, but they also feel that everyone is a part of that success. But they have to and they deserve to be happy because they have done a spotless, spotless clear race and then uh, you deserve to win. Tom, thank you so much for your time. You are Mr. Lamont. You have made our broadcast. There's 19 and a half minutes to go. Turn around, take the headsets off and enjoy this celebration with your teammates and we'll talk to you down the road. Keep your eyes out for Chris and Justin at the Audi Hospitality tonight. Make sure they behave themselves. <laughs>
There he is, Tom Christensen. What a real treat for us all. And it's Audi 1, 2 and 3. That's the way it will stay. And we'll wrap things up when we come back. Speed's coverage of the 24 Hours of Le Mans is brought to you by Porsche. There is no substitute. We are back for the final 15 minutes of the 78th running of the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Audi 1, 2 and 3 in P1. In P2 we have got the reigning American Le Mans Series champions. Highcroft Racing making their debut here today. However, Justin, it has not gone to plan, but are they planning something special for the end? <laughs> They're planning a little something. I'll get Rob to turn around in a minute. He's just about to get him to start. Rob, all I'm going to ask you, one question. Obviously, our American viewers really follow the Highcroft team. It's not been your perfect weekend, obviously, but you must know a lot more than when you started. Oh, absolutely. What a, what a phenomenal place this is. Uh, having never done this race before, it's... Uh, it's definitely a unique experience. Uh, I, mean, I think our whole team and our crew learned a, a tremendous amount from this place. Uh, I actually really wish we were going to be doing it again next week uh, to relive the experience because it is unbelievable. I'm sure the an analysis and debrief from here is will be unparalleled in probably the history of the team as you because you're going to have to start planning for next year, aren't you? Oh, we're already planning for that. So. We've well, had a couple of hours. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so Marino's just going to go out, do the last lap. The car can handle that. Yes, absolutely. I mean. Uh, we had an unfortunate problem, um, one that we've never ever experienced before, but it just it put us out of the running, and uh, we want to be a classified entrance, so uh, get a result from this, because uh, it's a big thing for Highcroft Racing, and for Duncan, and for the whole team, um, and it's us going forward. So when we come back here, we can actually say we've raced and finished before. You certainly will. We'll know what's going to happen next year. All Thank right. you, Robin. Guys in the booth. Thanks, Justin, and a man who has a, uh, a fabulous history in motorsport, particularly with Team Ganassi and in the IndyCar series. We'll talk more about that in a moment. We need to bring you up to date with what has gone on. We understand that not all of you could have watched the entire thing. So let's bring you up to date. It was Peugeot one through four at the start before you had to go back and pick up any of the Audis. Unfortunately for Nigel Mansell, his Le Mans debut was pretty much over soon after it got started. Yeah, the tyre problem there coming up from the Mulsanne towards Indianapolis. Here we see another replay of the hit. He also here on the other side of the racetrack. He was OK, but did visit the hospital. Hour three, car three. Pedro Lamy, his two co-driving teammates, uh, Sebastian Bourdais and Simon Pagano, did not even take the wheel in this race. Too much damage to the tub. It was assessed and decided upon very quickly that it was over and out. Can't wait for our pole sitter there. Bordet didn't even get to see the racetrack today. Very unfortunate for that whole squad. Scooter head to hour five, and this is what we were just talking about with Tom Christensen. Tom Christensen, of course, trying to go around the disabled BMW, the art car, with a flat left front tire. Look, he has nowhere to go. He only can go to the outside. Unfortunately, it gets him stuck there in the gravel. And that caused Charlie Lamb from Team Schnitzer to earn the wrath of Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, the head of Audi Sport. Going for three, the drive for three for Risi Competizione. It was brought to an abrupt halt with continual gearbox problems. And here we see some more action. Jean-Christophe Bouillon said his headlamps had failed as he came down in the four chicanes. They're on right now, however. His day was done. Massive shunt to the Rebellion team. And under a yellow flag condition as well. That was the sister car to the 12 that Marco Andretti was driving. And then in the morning hours, major drama for the race leading car, Frank Montagny and Olivier Canal thought his day was done. It was certainly over for, for Montagny and his co-drivers, but Peugeot was not done just yet. They were not. Look at Anthony Davidson. He had the hammer down. He was in kill mode. He was doing whatever it took to try and get the lead back with that number one car that had some problems. And then go, going through the field, this happened, Dorsey. Well, ringing the neck on his own car, he wrung the neck of the Corvette as well, pushing it wide into the dirty area. These guys worked frantically, did get the car back out on the racetrack, but an engine failure sidelined that effort. That was the GT2 class leading car, and it got back out. It circulated maybe a handful of times only to come up short with an engine problem, just like the last remaining Peugeot Sport entry with Alex Wirtz, the defending race winner behind the wheel. Peugeot's last roll of the dice was with Team Orica and Loic Duval, but a third engine problem 
for those Peugeot 908s left team principal Hugh Deshonak in disbelief. When we come back, we will take you to the chequered flag here at Lasaf. There's nothing like this moment. The run to the line. The crowd swells around the front straight from turn one down. Everyone wants to be there for the podium celebration. And there's our overall leader passing our GT2 leader, the Felbermeyer Proton Porsches. And Mark Lee, Wolf Hensler, what a run by those guys. And Richard Leitz, a superb trio, and they will enjoy victory in GT2. There's an American in the car for the finish, second in class in GT2, and that is Charleston, South Carolina's Lee Keane. What a moment for that young man. It's also been a bitter day, as we've spoken about so much in the last couple of hours for Hugh Deshaunag, but there is a sweetener right now because at the moment, the number six car, also entered by Orica, is fourth on the road. The 009 that we saw blow up has now been officially retired, so that drops from the classification. You have to be running at the checkered flag here today. So that car, the number six, now moves up to fourth overall in the first petrol-powered prototype in this field today. What's that say? Thanks a lot. <laughs> there you go, he said it for us. There you go. <laughs> this is awesome right now. You see the Audis running one, two, three. I don't think anybody had expected this. And right now, they just have to be enjoying every moment. I mean, there's nothing like seeing all three team cars running together, running up front. And boys, we're witnessing something special here. Think about the history that we embrace about this wonderful event. No one is even in the same zip code as Porsche as far as overall wins. They have 16. Ferrari's last overall win came in 1965. Today, Audi will draw level with Ferrari with nine overall wins. That is significant in the history of this event. It's the 78th running of Le Mans and Audi draws level with Ferrari. That's something that will be not lost in Ingolstadt. And I don't think Audi even saw this coming, you know. I mean, they just didn't have the speed of the Peugeots, and you might expect one of the four of them to break, but not all four, and any one of those four Peugeots had the legs, they had the speed to win this race, no question about that. Englishman uh, Danny Watts and Nick Leventis and Ulsterman, Johnny Kane, who has called England home for so long, what a display this has been from the lead P2 car, Cal. They have never been headed in this race. And we wondered about the pace they were running there. Started run lap times right around their qualifying pace, but the car has held together. The boys haven't put a foot wrong despite their incredible run here this afternoon and uh, throughout the course of the last 24 hours. And uh, really a credit to HPD, the performance of not only the engine, but that chassis is the ex Adrian Fernandez car that won the LMP2 title in the ALMS series last year. It's performed wonders here today with that new aero body kit on it as well. It's amazing, too, because Highcroft Racing from the United States, Duncan Dayton's team, had a different philosophy. They stuck to their game plan and ran a conservative pace, and there's the, there is the engine that broke. So you just don't know. For these boys in the nine, I think we've mentioned several times, they have all <laughs> enjoyed victory in the GT2 class. He's not giving up. Here at Future Le Drive, we're in training right there. <laughs> yeah. He still loves Peugeot. Yeah. You see the flag. I say engine broke on, on the high crop car, and it's not really true. As the engine's still running. It's just had an overheating problem. That could be a bunch of different things that probably will never happen again, I'm sure. For Timo Bernard, I guarantee you, he's hearing every Pebble. <laughs> <laughs> every pebble, every vibration, every sound, every everything as he makes it to the checkered flag. Being being up front, if you're racing head to head with somebody, you don't think about it, but when you're by yourself or by your teammates like, like we're seeing right now, you're just praying, come on, baby, let's get to the checkered. Those last couple of hours whilst he's been in the car must have seemed like <laughs> two years in his life. Romain Dumas, tense, tense moments. Hang in there, mate. You've got less than three minutes to go. <laughs> we just saw it there, too. What about that 10-year-old GT1 Celine, boys? Yeah, it's going to win GT1. That is Gabriel Gardel behind the wheel for Labra competition. The Corvette for Luke Alphon is second. What a shame for those Maytech competition four GTs because, boy, they were strong, particularly the 60. But it went out many, many hours ago. Yeah, not by a problem of its own, too, getting run into from, from behind. But this is what it's all about. They're on their way home. God, what beautiful shots and what beautiful weather we've seen for this whole race. 
This should be their last yeah. lap, I would believe. Just over two minutes on the clock. Smashes the distance record run. Loic Duval was just being congratulated there by Hugh Deshonak. Consoled and congratulated at the same time. Well, we are level with the overall largest amount of laps run. However, as far as pure mileage, this is a Le Mans record as far as distance travelled in the history of this amazing event. And isn't that something to put to bed for Timo Bernard, Mike Rockefeller, and Romain Dumas? They're part of something very, very special. We'll see new cars from Audi and from Peugeot next year. The fight will continue. Yeah, this is essentially the fastest Le Mans race ever. And you'd have to think with the new technology, have they pegged them back enough? What will the engineers come up with in terms of the power plants to achieve the same sort of lap times as we're seeing this year? This has been an incredible pace. Maybe the pace was so hard, that was what broke the Peugeots. Hard to say. Maybe it was just a component failure, the same one. But there we see Timo Bernard. Don't wave too early, mate. I've seen <laughs> Nigel Mansell do that, and uh, the car can't go. Oh. Well, everybody looks to Formula One as the premier category in world motorsport for the leading edge of technology. Don't turn your nose up at this either. This is world leading stuff in diesel technology and in sports car and endurance technology to push your car to the limit sprint style for 24 hours and be the survivor. Not only be the, the winning survivor, but how about one, two, three for the four circles, for the four rings. And I believe that coming to Lamont for a manufacturer this is where you learn how to develop technologies for street cars more so than Formula, a lot more so than Formula One a lot of the technologies that Audi's learned here reliability efficiency they've adapted in their street cars and here we come sneaking up on the run to the checkered flag right now and remember that was the statement made earlier this week Audi brings a plus in efficiency to Le Mans. I'll tell you what, the emotion is really going to kick in for Romar Dumas, Mike Rockefeller. They have had so much success in their relatively young careers, but Le Mans is special. And I tell you what, when their teammate crosses their line, it is going to kick in big time. Remember, Rocky, Mike Rockefeller joins the greats of Al Holbert, Hurley Hayward, Derek Bell, and Jan Lammers in winning the Rolex 24 at Daytona and the 24 hours of Le Mans in the same year. And that's an incredible achievement, winning Daytona and winning Le Mans, but doing it in the same year. Wow. What They're all poised. And Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich can breathe the most massive sigh of relief. The pressure that was put on that man's shoulders politically, internally at Audi to deliver was immense. And that was a word that the eight-time winner Tom Christensen used, and it's an appropriate adjective. The boys from the eight, Trellier, and uh, Andre Lotter and Marcel Fessler, they will get to stand on the podium as well. And so too Dindo, Tom and Alan. But the glory and the victory belongs to car number nine. The traditional flag waving from the corner marshals who have been there every moment of this race and all week long <laughs> from Wednesday onwards. A year ago, it was the lion that roared. Audi has owned this place for the last decade. This now marks nine wins in 11 years. Audi were pushed back down the stairs last year by Peugeot, but they are back. Audi back to where they belong at Le Mans. One, two, and three, a whitewash at Lassar. And what about this for three super guys, super talented drivers, Rockefeller, Dumas, and Timo Bernard. It's been incredible. And this is where it gets wild. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. They've even designed those cars so they can make the turn and yeah. fit in. Yeah. Usually you can't do that without pushing back. If I designed it, you'd be done a three-point turn. <laughs> There's Alan McNish congratulating Wolfgang Ulrich. They've been through a lot together. And as the old, elder statesman in the team, they'll be proud of their young chargers, their young teammates. Chris is amongst it all. Chris. Dr. Ulrich giving high fives to all of his engineers on pit lane. Dr. Ulrich. Oh, he's moving over to the number eight engineers right now. You've engineered this team back to... Oh, guys, I think he's got to just try and work his way around. He's, he's, he's focused on his crew right now. He's pushing all the television away. 
This is when the team, the drivers, everybody shares this victory together. It's so much effort and energy and preparation before you get here. And then completing it like this, wow. Look at the emotion. And for Ralph Jutner, the man in the glasses there, the technical director for Audi Sport. He shares a huge part and has huge equity in this victory. And that's why he was pushing the TV cameras away because he's crying too. I'll Dor guarantee Dorsey, you. Are you crying down there? No, I'm good. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I guarantee if you talk to Ralph Jutner about when do you prepare for next year, he'll say tomorrow morning. It never stops. Maybe after midday tomorrow. After <laughs> They'll midday. probably have a hangover. <laughs> they know how to celebrate, that's for sure. We've been there with them. And there's the man in charge of it all. You know, we talked about the eight car being the young guns at Audi, but this is really the future as Timo steps out. When you look at the ages, Rockenfeller at 25, Timo at 29, and Roma at 32, they're actually younger on average than the newcomers in the eight car. You are looking at the future of Audi. And Chris is there. Chris, can you get Ulrich? Dr. Ulrich, you engineered the team back to victory lane. Have you finally taken a sigh of relief? Yeah, it's great here, and everybody should celebrate. Uh, a perfect team job, that's what I can say. Thank I you. remember the emotion last year on your face when Peugeot won, but a loss like that, does that make a victory like this feel so much sweeter? Yeah, man, a victory is always sweet. The bad thing is that there is always a loser. Congratulations. Dr. Ulrich showing some compassion for Peugeot. He did not want to see them go out in that fashion. As far as LMP2, the Stracker boys have done it. We knew that that was going to happen. That was a comprehensive victory. In GT1, the Labra competition, Celine has done it. And in GT2, well done to Mark Lieb, Richard Leitz, and Wolf Hensler, victorious in GT2. There we saw the two HPD cars. Stracker get the victory in P2. Highcroft come across the line and finish their first event at Le Mans. That's a big moment for that team, led by Duncan Dayton and Robin Hill. Highcroft yeah, did get a it great here. job. Yeah, Chris, go for it. Well, we can see Mike Rockefeller walking down pit lane. You know, I think it's been about 10 years since we saw Mike Rockefeller come to the U.S. and we've seen him do great stuff in GT cars. We saw him move to LMP1 and we knew he was going to do great things. He's uh, he's talking with the Audi press right now. Mike, awesome job. We knew it was going to finally come. You get the overall victory at Le Mans. It's unbelievable. Uh, what can I say? I mean, I didn't expect it like this year in Daytona where I didn't expect to win. And I think uh, we did a really, you know, good job, clean job. And uh, of course, we were lucky that, uh, you know, our main competitor had so many problems, but they were so strong. And uh, even though I think we never gave up, we, we stick to our plan. And finally, you know, after the struggle I had here in Le Mans, I won Le Mans, so it's unbelievable. Thanks. Thinking of the strength we saw from Peugeot yesterday, being a young driver, does that sometimes think, how are we going to get out of this? How are we going to come away with victory? No, because I have seen how it works 2008, uh, you know, when Tom, Allen and Dindo won with a car which was basically slower and uh, we had the same target, the same challenge and uh, we made it again. So it's unbelievable. Well, he won the Rolex 24 at Daytona and now he's won Le Mans. Congratulations. What an achievement. Hard to get better than that. I don't know where you'd go from there. And Rocky is normally a little more lively than that. I think he is overwhelmed by the moment and truly exhausted. That is a huge day. We're going to sneak in a quick commercial break and the entire wrap up and victory celebration, the podium affairs when we come back. Alan McNish, Alan McNish receiving the congratulations from Henri Pescarolo, but there is the man, one of the men of the moment, Romain Dumas, waiting to join up. There's Timo Bernard there. Where is Rocky? Mike Rockenfeller needs to come into the picture as well. Dindo and Alan are there, ready to stand out on the podium. Not on a step that they like to stand on, but to be there with their Audi brethren, what a moment. To own that podium at La Sarthe is truly special. There's Henri Pescarolo. Mixed emotions for him. Not being here, not running a team, not competing for the first time in some 40 years. And you may have just seen there Mike Rockefeller's with his boys. The successful trio. That looks pumped up this time. 
Two German and a Frenchman. This will be special for Dumas. Any partying going on tonight, boys? <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's going to be big. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. Oh, it's going to run into the wee hours of the morning. Another 24-hour event. <laughs> I want the aspirin concession for the morning. Dumas is like a helicopter. You just got to stand back and let him go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get in the way. While we wait for the victory celebrations, just a few moments ago, Justin Bell caught up with two of the successful three from Stracker Racing. Let's hear from them. Hey, Nick fantastic obviously for your team hey johnny brilliant mate Thank you. so exciting for a british team a young british team to come here and win i bet you can't even believe it absolutely i'm speechless it's a fantastic team effort from everyone involved and uh, to bounce back from what happened at spa a couple of months ago it's just to come here and win is just fantastic it's just incredible savor the moment i mean it really is special isn't it johnny yeah i mean my seventh time only the second time i've finished second last year one better this time but uh, uh stracker have put together an amazing Amazing car, not one single problem, and the guys have worked so hard to get us here, and uh, I'm just glad we're delivered for them. Enjoy the trophies, guys. And they will, and they will, as here come the masses. Everyone wants a little piece of this podium celebration. That's why they got to put the boys up there in the air because they get mobbed if they're down at ground level. It's amazing when you get to the end of the race like that. We won there with uh, with Corvette. The people, I mean, you have to lock everything down. It's just a mass of people work their way onto the racetrack, into the pit area. It's just absolutely incredible. There she sits. And Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich congratulating Timo Bernard and Mike Rockefeller. And that's special because the belief that Dr. Ulrich has kept in Mike Rockefeller when he made his debut in one of these P1 machines in 2007 and destroyed his car in Tet Rouge. That was uh, hard pitches to watch as he was trying to figure out some way to fix that car, get it back to pit lane so his crew could work on it. And probably after about 45 minutes, he eventually gave up and was just totally devastated by the mistake that he made to come back, bounce back, and finally get his first overall victory is something special today. This is a payback, no question about that. And, and then that. a crash in testing at Sebring this year in the R15, plus a big crash there as well, but Dr. Ulrich has stood behind him, and you got to believe the words of Tom Christensen probably sit in Dr. Ulrich's mind as well. Tom Christensen, Tom Christensen sees magic in Mike Rockefeller. Here come the boys out onto the podium. And it's a Michelin whitewash as well. Not only the top three in P1, but all class winners, Michelin shot cars, Christensen, Capello and McNish. Third place in the 2010, 24 hours of Le Mans. Well, it didn't rain during this 24 hours, but I suspect it's going to very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's a distance record. The There's farthest that anyone has gone in the history of this event. And I think they have plenty of French champagne over there to go around. Mm -hmm. We, all right, get ready for the moment. Soak this up, because here come your winners. Timo Bernard, Mike Rockefeller, and Romain Dumas. Rocky. There's Mike. <laughs> there's there's <laughs> the real Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Not subdued anymore. Podium right there, the winning Audi right below. Tom Christensen is now an ambassador for the Rolex company. Joins Roger Penske, Jackie Stewart. It's a very select group of people who represent Rolex, and Tom is now on board as well. Really is a magic moment. You can imagine a lot of things in life, but imagine standing up there, the overall victor.
Are we witnessing a changing of the guard at Audi? Perhaps so. What a dynamic trio. Lee, I hate to say this, but it's probably not the only German victory today as Aussie are going to play them in <laughs> soccer in the World Cup a little bit later this afternoon. Hush. Probably going to pummel them. Hush. <laughs> Just because you got a lucky goal against the U.S. <laughs> you, know, you talk about the changing face. We, we've seen the new rules for 2011, changing technology, and I think we're seeing the changing face of new winners and uh, perhaps the future. It's, it's impressive, impressive indeed. One thing that remains is the strength of Audi. This is what it's all about for Audi, for all the engineers, all the mechanics for Michelin. All Everybody's been working together. This is their race that they go after. Their Indy 500 of the US. And it's a clean sheet of paper for next year. We regroup. It's hard to believe. I mean, beautiful car like that, victory lane, now it's sent to the museum. To the museum, exactly. Working on uh, new plans for next year. This will make that next meeting with the board of Audi <laughs> yes, uh, a little easier, won't it, for yes, Dr. Ulrich? And when they talk about a little budget, well, this makes it a lot, a lot easier to ask for that kind of money. And that's exactly what happened. Dr. Ulrich had to ask for the resources lot this year. Last year, budgets were cut back. They didn't have the race programs in place to really test their race cars prior to Le Mans correctly. They came here and had egg on their face, and they returned this year with much stronger cars. They still didn't have the ultimate pace of the Peugeots, but they were beefed up, they were stronger. They didn't break. A lot of us believe that the collateral that he used was probably his job. Well, that was talked about, I'm sure. We will see the R15 Plus at Petit Le Mans Road Atlanta later this year. Audi have committed to competing in that because it's part of the three-round Intercontinental Cup. However, we might see these cars race a little more, depending on the result. Well, the here. result <laughs> says got, it all. Rocky's got two. <laughs> What's he going to do with all that? He's got two arms. <laughs> <laughs> so they may do more rounds in the European LMS series. We'll wait and see on that. But we're delighted that we will see them at the end of the year at Road Atlanta in Petit, Petit Le Mans. Special piece of jewelry, that Rolex on the back of it. Winners, whether it's Daytona, whether it's uh, Le Mans. You have a few of those, right, Scott? I have a few of those. <laughs> yeah, I've been very fortunate over the years. We love, uh, we love those Rolexes. <laughs> Do you wear yours? I know a lot of the boys just kind of put them in the safe. Don't I, I have, and I've uh, actually I've, I'm giving each of my kids one every time they well every time each each <laughs> time they turn 21. That's cool for a present, something to a memory. You can buy man. you can buy a Rolex, but you can't buy one of those yeah. without engraving. You earn those. He's got enough strength to lift those big trophies. <laughs> wow. After 24. That one's uh. going to get away. <laughs> 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 That's a big one. You look forward to taking that one back to home base on Monday. We need to squeeze in a quick break. When we come back, we'll hear from more who are celebrating here at LaSalle. Stay with us. Just a few moments ago, the boys hoisted the big one, along with their boss. It's a wobbly. Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich sharing in the moment. And the German flags fly proud at Le Mans. Let's uh, regroup and recap some of the results for you. Brian, let's start with LMP1 and the top five overall. Well, the top three is real easy to run through. Audi, Audi, Audi for Rockefeller, Bernard, and Dumas. We talked about it. Is this the future of Audi? I certainly believe it is. You have to go back to fourth before you get to the first petrol-powered car. What a great run for Hugh de Shawnak and his team, Andre, Ariare, and Merrick. And early on, with the driving of Ariare, kind of interesting to see that they made it to the end. 
That's top five in P1, top five in P2. We know the winners. The Stracker boys did a remarkable job. Oak Racing claiming second, RML third. And unfortunately, our Highcroft boys not in that top five. They very well should have been. But as you heard from Robin Hill, the crew chief team leader, we have learned so much and we're already ready to do it again. Let's switch gears and go to GT1 because this was the class that nobody wanted to win. It perhaps should have been a Maytech competition for GT, but it couldn't go the distance. The Celine for Labra competition did ahead of Luke Alphonse Chevrolet and then the Aston Martin, the young driver squad coming in on the podium in third. Let's catch up with one of our GT1 competitors celebrating with Justin Bell. I'm here with Roland Breville, obviously winner in the Celine. Fantastic. You had a big, the night was not easy for you, but Celine wins 10 years later. Incredible. Yeah. So you're American and uh, Saline is American, so I'm, I'm glad to, to, to talk to you, to answer to your questions. Saline is a well-known car in, in Europe and in France because uh, Oreca developed this car and now Larbo competition. My team is uh, having two cars and we engage one in uh, Le Mans. Last year in Le Mans series and I finished second of the championship and this year we win Le Mans, so it's perfect and I, I really like this car. It's perfect for long distance races. Well done, great job. As the boys continue the celebrations, let's go to GT2 and highlight the top five. Take a look at the top five and what is missing in the top five? Where is the Risi Competizione Ferrari? We chronicled their problems early on and it's Porsche back on top with Lieb, Leitz and Hensler. And there'll be plenty of celebration in that camp. Jamie Howe is caught up with the winners in GT2. Mark Lee bringing the car home to take that 24-hour Le Mans trophy back to Porsche. Tell me about this race. Well, it was an unreal race. I mean, there were so many incidents and accidents. And at the beginning, we weren't there. We had no speed. But then suddenly in the night, we were there. And we could follow the Corvettes and the Ferraris. The car was fantastic to drive in the night. It was just fantastic. And we all very happy. It was amazing. Much congratulations. Thank you very much. and make amends this year. They did that. When we come back, we're going to wrap things up. We've got Dorsey's pacemaker cranked up. We'll get final <laughs> thoughts right after this. It has been quite the journey, not only for everybody competing at Le Mans this year, but also for us bringing you 25 hours of coverage on speed and speed.com. We start with final thoughts and we start with a Le Mans winner, Scott Pruitt. It's been great to have you as part of the team. I just want to thank you guys for letting me be part of the program and, and being on this side of it. I'm looking forward to getting back to my dining BMW and, and seeing you guys next week at Mid-Ohio. Let's go racing again. Brian. You know, it was full of surprises, but it always is. Not surprising to see Audi up top on the top step of the podium. Perhaps a little bit surprising the way they got there, but that's what makes Le Mans great. There are surprises always for 24 hours. Cal. And uh, this is such a special race, and we saw the emotion in victory, and particularly in defeat, the Peugeots. I mean, they had such a fast car here today, both the Peugeot factory team, the Orica team and tears were shed throughout the course of this race by those teams and drivers. Dorse? I can't believe the lessons that this race teaches, and those lessons go broad scale all the way across engine building, technology, and after the years of being here and looking at this race, this race is very important. And I think one thing we've come to learn over the years is when you think something is predictable at Le Mans, it turns you around and reminds you that nothing is predictable in this 24-hour endurance classic. It has been a big journey for us on behalf of all of the on-air team and everybody on the production staff here at Speed. Thanks for being with us, whether it was on the network or on the website, speed.com. It's been a remarkable journey, and Audi domination is one to remember, and we regroup in 12 months' time to do it all again, the ultimate fight. Don't forget more sports cars on speed with the American Le Mans series in Grand Am. Next round of the ALMS is at Miller Motorsports Park, Salt Lake City. Next round of the Grand Am Rolex sports car series next week at Mid-Ohio. Thanks for watching Sports Cars on Speed, another memorable edition of the 24 Hours of Le Mans.